What's going on, everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys know who it is. This is Kevin from the C H O R D Chord Progression Podcast, brought to you by My Song Day Rock 2008. Wishing you a very happy Thursday. It is April 9th, and we have another very special episode for you today. But before we go into why this episode is so special, please let me go through my list plugs so if we had any advertising this is where it would go i don't so we're just gonna plug my song of day stuff so please follow us on all our social media platforms facebook twitter instagram instagram is our most popular at the moment we also do everything that we do on twitter and facebook as there as well such as the 30 second song of the day previews anytime a podcast is released anytime a youtube video is released but we also do stuff on there such as our IGTV channel, which is a behind the scenes look at what's going on here at My Song Today every single Tuesday and every single Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Central. We do an Instagram live so you can come talk to us live for an hour. We have a good time talking about music and whatever. And if you're listening to this on the day of the release, so Thursday, April 9th, please join us for a very special live stream tonight because we'll be celebrating the birthday of one of our followers. It's our 21st birthday. Her name is Medi, and we are Plan on having her on the podcast when the new A Day to Remember album comes out because she's ready to review it. Or if Beartooth comes out with their new album first, whichever one happens first. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where you can watch these podcast episodes. And you can also watch all our album reviews and all our fun videos on there. If you want to listen to the Core Progression podcast, you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. You can also subscribe to our Amazon Alexa skill because you can hear the whole entire Song of the Day feature on there. And also enjoy the full Song of the Day feature for our Small Band Saturday feature, which we feature smaller bands that are yet to make the big time and you can get in on them early there. So links in the description below for the video in the podcast notes. So yeah, that's our shameless plugs, but now onto our featured presentation. So if you guys have seen and paid attention to the podcast as of late, one thing we've been very big on is interviewing these emerging bands and artists that are going to be gigantic in the scene come 2022, 2023, 2029. By 2029, I'm expecting a lot of these bands to be some of the biggest bands in the world. So you've heard bands like GFM. You've heard bands like Zume, Amongst the Giants, Kill the Blonde, Stay in the Canvas, Eli, Waves in Autumn. Now... I'm changing up on this one. So why am I changing up on this one? Because we had a new album come out on April 3rd called Declaration by Red. And one of our Instagram followers messaged us saying, hey, man, can we do a podcast episode where we review Declaration by Red? I really want to talk about it. And you want to know what my answer was? My answer was, oh, hell yeah, we're going to do it. So we were planning on doing this one a week later than the time this podcast actually came out. But Red decided, hey, we're going to release Declaration on the 3rd and not the 10th. So he's like, shoot, are we still going to be able to do it? And I said, fuck yeah, we're still going to be able to do it. So get ready, everybody. We've got a very special fan review with us and a fan interview with us. So please get ready for James from Canada as he is going to be on the Core Progression Podcast with us for a great, fun review of Declaration by Red and then just some fun story sharing. So... Sit back, get your popcorn ready, and let's go! Yeah! Hey, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners of the Chord Progression Podcast. We've been interviewing a lot of bands lately, but this one, we're going different. We have one of our My Song Day Rock Tales and Today fans here with us. We have James here with us. So, James, say hi to everybody, and welcome to the show. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Man, it's it's going fine as fine can be in this crazy time of life that we are living in where we're all stuck inside just waiting for everything to get done with so we can go back outside and start rocking out again like, yeah! yeah. We want to go to all our summer concerts, you know? Yeah, I mean, have you had any that have really been like postponed yet or canceled at all up to this point? Well, right now, everything's kind of up in the air because my concerts, like the most of the ones I've been listening to are listed for like the start of June and out through the summer. So they haven't necessarily been canceled yet. Like some of the t- ones I have tickets for Megadeth and Lamb of God, they haven't canceled it yet, but they're coming to my city in the end of June. And then there's other ones. I think, uh, uh, the corn one that's the in for September. So that one will come in later. I'm hoping they won't have to cancel shows like that, but up until now we just have to wait and see. Yeah. So, 
you know what's going uh, on. Understandable. Same here, because so far for me, I'm trying to think like We Came as Romans and Devil Wears Prada that got postponed till August, and now Damn. I'm not able to see that show because they postponed it the same day that the Indianapolis 500 was rescheduled for, and I'm going to see the race with my dad and my brother. And it's do I go to the oh, concert nice. or go to the race? I'm like, well. I'd, in that instance, especially if I've already seen the Devil Wears Prada before, it sucks that I can't right. see We Came as Romans play their whole entire It's Plants a Seed album for the last time, but because that's right. the last show of that tour. So I'm like, damn. But oh, you know damn, what? That's for sucks. the family, uh, I'm missing. Uh, well, this it got postponed. No uh, rescheduled date yet was uh, Black Veil Brides and In This Moment. So nothing on that Ooh, one. That sucks. Uh, I'm trying to think <laughs> what else has got postponed. Uh, Amity Affliction and Sleeping with Sirens. But I, I had tickets for that one, but it was going to be the day before the original date for the Indianapolis 500. So I wasn't even supposed to go oh, to that one. I just had a ticket for it. But now if it, when it gets rescheduled, I'll be able to go and see uh, Sleeping with Sirens. Uh, the cool. one that pisses me off the most, though, was one of my favorite bands. It looked it had, like they had a great tour coming up and they canceled it. And it was oh, Hollywood Undead one. with Bad Wolves, Fire from the Gods. Oh, and uh, shoot, who was the other one? Was it? It wasn't from Lost of Flames. Uh, I can't. God, it's gonna kill me. Who uh, the other one from Ashes to New? That was it, right? So that, and that was gonna be Bad Wolf. Bad Wolf's <laughs> first like co-headlining tour. Like they weren't opening that time. That was gonna be yeah. Sick. They were gonna be a co-headliner, but like Hollywood and Dead was still like the top. Like you know, like between yeah, the two yeah. co-headliners, like Hollywood and Dead was like the one on there. And I haven't seen mm-hmm. him in over three years i'm like oh man that sucks but yeah, that sucks there's one of the shows uh the five figure death punch with dice and iron kills and i prevail they uh they rescheduled it to like november and they're coming to detroit <laughs> then and i'm actually might be able to go to that show because i'll be 18 by then nice so that kind of worked out in my favor yeah i'm absolutely kind of well selfishly i'm kind of pissed about that because <laughs> even though it's like now i might have a better chance to actually go see the show when they're in chicago Cause it was going right. to be like the, it was going to be like a couple of days before that whole entire initial me going to see the Indy 500 with my fam, with my dad and my brother. And it was like, shoot, I'm not gonna be able to make it because I, I, I wanted to go see five finger death punch. Say I saw him at least once. I've already seen Papa Roach and I wouldn't mind seeing him again. I've already seen I prevail. And well, when I saw I prevail, they were definitely the weakest out of the three, but they were also oh, competing really? with bear tooth and a day to remember. So I was like, okay, well. <laughs> And, you can't complain. Yeah. Much. And also because, well, I, I, I would love to see Ice Nine Kills play on a huge stage, on like a, so at a cool big man. stage. But also, it's like they're the opener, so they're going to play like six, seven songs. I'm like, shit, they I need know. at least. Like when I saw them, they're like, they, they, they played like not, an hour long set, you know? Dude, I saw them, they played 19 <laughs> songs. They were on stage for almost two hours. Damn. And that, 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 was, that was well worth it. But I'm pissed about because I looked at the date when they were going to be in Chicago. I'm like, they're going to be there November 5th. And where I got pissed oh, off at that was oh. like, that means that Ice Nine Kills isn't going to be on a headlining tour uh, with like, in like, you know, like the uh, more like the club shows. Right, because right. I'm like, and it's going to be around Halloween. Like that would have been perfect. I would have oh, loved to have seen him again. Because so cool. last year I saw yeah. him two days after Halloween and it was just like, that is oh so cool. my God. You get the whole experience of that, right? Oh yeah. And then the, the other, the only other one that's like coming up, only other show that I have the ticket for right now that's coming up that I'm nervous about is in about middle of June. And I'm not sure what's going on with that one, but I'm supposed to go see As I Lay Dying. Oh, that's good. That would be a really good show. Hopefully, yeah. you get to see that. I'm, I'm hoping so. Otherwise, then it's uh, then for me, it's like I, then it's in July. Well, that's a little bit further ahead of time because going to a music one music festival here in Wisconsin because two of the bands I've interviewed on the podcast are performing at this festival. So oh, I'm like, that's so cool. I, and they're on the you same and they're on the same day too, and they're performing. Really? And they're and they're and like uh because the band called this first band is called the Monks of Giants and they play like right before the headliner goes on and the headliner is oh, band, wow. uh, Go Frankenstein's and Merge GFM and I've interviewed them twice and I was already going to go and see GFM and hang out with them like but now I get to go in the other one I'm like this is gonna be great you get to see the second so, band. so nice. I don't want to I don't want to see that one get postponed or canceled same thing with Rock Fest I want to go and hang out with my fr- oh, my yeah. friends there we're gonna have a good time there. And then August comes around and it's like, I've got a weekend where Thursday I get to go see Skillet. Friday oh, I get to see the Breaking Benjamin tour with Saint of Sonia because I've not seen Adam Gontier perform live yet. And I really, 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 really want to. And then the, oh, the day after that, it gets even better because I get to go see Deftones. 
Nice. That, 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 that's a three day stretch. I'm like, please don't fuck lineup. this up. Like, I want to see this. <laughs> oh my god. The one concert I'm most excited for for the summer is on August 11th, which is my birthday. Is Disturbed and Bad Wolves with Stained. Ooh. They're coming to my city in Toronto. So I really hope I get to see the birthday show. And then two days after that is the Motley Crue, Def Leppard, Poison, and Joan Jett. That whole like 80s mashup yeah, yeah, big yeah, yeah. tour. That's on the 13th in Buffalo. So I'm hoping at least those two concerts in August will be able to get salvaged. I mean, I'm, so much. I mean, I'm assuming that those concerts in July and August are going to be perfectly fine. It's, I hope so. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm making an assumption without really any basis of fact because yeah, I'm not. Like, I'm you not, just want to like tell yourself that, right? Yeah, I just want to tell myself like I want to make sure, I want to be able to see these shows, and it's like the ones I really want to be able to see are, well, it's I want to I want to see all of them, but like the two that I'm really big on are the music festival with the two bands uh, amongst the giants and GFM that I've already made connections with, and I want to go and actually see them play live in person right. and have fun time doing that. And then uh, go and see Breaking Benjamin because I like I love Breaking Benjamin, and then see Saint Sonia so I can see Adam Gante perform live for the first time in oh, my yes. in my life. It's like, and then after that's like, well, I really want to go see Deftones as well because I'll be in like because right. uh, I won't be able to mosh at the other two due to the fact of their uh, we're at Skillet or at Breaking Benjamin and Saint Sonia due to the fact of where they are. But Deftones right. is in the perfect spot, is in my favorite spot to go nice. see a show. So I'm like, I am going to be ready to go. I'm going to be really <laughs> tired, but you just got to get you know like you know a couple shots Injury. of adrenaline. <laughs> get it going you know as soon as the band starts like it's gonna go off right oh god yeah well that's gonna be the same thing too it's like once this is all over it's those concerts i mean anything is gonna be amped up but those concerts especially but for rock and metal because all these artists are sitting at home right now they want it like especially they have new music out right now take august burns red Mm -hmm. and red for example they just put them out there and trivium as well who's coming out their new album at the end of the month it's they're gonna be dying to get out there to perform and play Uh, these shows and the fans are gonna be get just finally you know emerging from quarantine being so cooped up it's honestly it's got to start all you have to do is you have to just make sure your show starts out with something that's going to get the crowd just to go absolutely bonkers and it's gonna work absolutely man and one thing i actually thought about too is the bands that are like coming off of long touring cycles right now while they're in this like quarantine time i'm kind of hoping they're going to be like writing new music so like once this is all over we'll have a lot of new stuff to come back to as well (laughs) I, I think maybe I think there's a couple of things with that. It's I think in the end, I mean, there's gonna be they're gonna be able to write stuff, but they're not gonna be able to really see how it's gonna collaborate with that, with the other guys as much as because you're not gonna be in sure, that recording yeah. space together. Because I'll I'll use Disturbed as an example because all four guys live in four different air er- four different spots. Because I think mm-hmm. uh, David lives out in California. Uh, I know John Moyer is in Texas. I think Dan Donegan is in Illinois and then Mike Wengren is here in Wisconsin. So it's like they're oh, kind of wow. so it's like you're kind of all over the place. I'm just using them as an example to show like the difference mm-hmm. in demographics of where they live just because you can't really get together and put this up together. I mean, you can send it online and everything, but it's just you're not going to mm-hmm. get the same feel and the it, direct feedback of all of a sudden, okay, I wrote this, let's see how it sounds all of a sudden you're playing it with, you know, say say David wrote something, all of a sudden you're playing it with uh, Dan and John Moyer and all of a sudden it's like they're playing and all of a sudden someone gets an idea and it's like, well, we really need to have, I need to explain this to you and I really want you to try this. So let's see what this happens. See if this works. See about maybe yeah, makes changing the riff around to a little bit, something like this and just getting an idea. It's like, well then, you know, it's just the timing and just the uh, logistics of sending everything online. It just, it's really yeah. tough. I mean, there's definitely going to be a lot of writing going on because I've seen a lot of artists writing or a lot of artists mm-hmm. doing like, I think uh, from Ashes and News doing a lot of covers. Like they're just yeah, having fun yeah. with it. Cause I, I know they did. A lot of the bands are doing live performances on like uh, online live streams and things like that too, which is really cool. Yeah. Cause I mean, I mean, I remember right when this whole entire thing started, like within the United States, uh, cause it was right around St. Patrick's day, Dropkick Murphy's yeah. had a huge show in Boston and it was, they were still able to get together. So they took their recording uh, space. Ever, they showed up there and they really put on a whole show in their re- uh, rehearsal space. And I thought that was absolutely awesome that they did yeah. that. And I knew a lot That's of bands, I knew a lot of bands are going to end up doing that as well. Something like, you know, trying to get the music out, play live. But with the other bands I've been talking to as well, it's just, I mean, that's always a good idea if you can pull it off, but it's also, that's something that everyone is going to end up doing. That was like the first thing that people were going to yeah. do. And that was the first thing it's I thought be fans are going to do. It's got to be more trend that comes on too now, I guess. 
Oh, very much so. So I'm always looking at what else can you do? Like what, what else are right. you going to be able to do? And I know for some of these artists, I mean, they're going to be writing music, preparing for a new album. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I hope it's really going to work out well, especially for some of the albums that like I've been waiting for from I some know. bands. Like, I'm like, thinking, I'm thinking like in the long run, like for bands I was hoping for to record like next year, I'm hoping they'll still be able to find the inspiration and ideas to come up with like really good music for the band to want to come in the next cycle of things. But that's what I'm hoping. You don't really know it's all in the air right now. I'll say that's what I'm hoping for for uh, from Rise Against, just because I know they've been working mm-hmm. on an album for like over a year now. But it was just gonna be like whatever, co- like whatever, whatever comes to them. Whatever they get the inspiration, because they're not going to just push out an album just to push out an album. No, I'm thinking no. like they got a lot to go off on, and now there's this. I'm like, this yes, is. I'm like, Tim Macrass going to make up something incredible on this, and I'm just, I'm uh, just yeah. waiting for it. It's going to be so good. <laughs> well, speaking of new albums, I mean, we're here to really talk about the new Red album, Declaration, right. which for my, per- for my personal, t- uh, like what I was doing. I got a little selfish when I thought they were going to release it a week earlier. And it's not because of like maybe like, oh, they they should have stuck with what they did. No, it was because right. my selfish reasons was I was prepared to review the August Burns Red album. And I'm like, OK, might do Barry tomorrow if they release it on August, April 3rd. I'm not entirely sure. Barry tomorrow put it back three months. I was like, OK, you know, Ooh. I guess I just get August Burns Red. This is going to be fun because I can really focus in on that. Mm-hmm. And then I had two other podcast interviews already set up for that week. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be fun. This will be good. We got this. All of a sudden, as you uh, <laughs> sent me in the DM, they're like, uh, something's going on here. <laughs> so we waited yeah. for the announcement to come. And Red was going to release their album a week early so that everyone who's been sitting around at home and quarantine and everything was going to be able to listen to it earlier and really connect with it faster. And for my selfish thing, it was like, dang, that means more work for me in one weekend. But yeah, <laughs> I understand completely why they did it. And mm-hmm. I mean, Just to give some fans some hope with having all this going on. It's like, you know what? We'll do something nice for you. This is something we can do to kind of make things a little better at home for you. Oh, very much. So that's why I was kind of curious why Barry tomorrow really, I, I get why they pushed theirs back to the beginning of July, just so that everyone, so it's like they can uh, coincide with a tour and they can play everything yeah. live for all their fans. However, the one thing I didn't like about it, it's like people are just begging for new things. I, I mean, literally. I mean, right. take a look at Netflix. They put out some. They put out a tiger documentary about uh, Joe Exotic, <laughs> and all of a sudden it becomes yeah. the big. It becomes the second biggest thing in March behind this whole entire virus thing. I mean, <laughs> you went on Facebook, it was like or Twitter or Instagram. No matter what, it was always like virus, virus. Tiger documentary, virus, tiger yep. documentary, virus, virus, <laughs> tiger documentary. Too. It blew up like so quickly. I, I've not watched it and I honestly don't think I will just to, <laughs> just so I can still be in that minority of I have not That's seen fair. it. That's Same fair. thing with Game of Thrones. I'm like, I want to stay in that minority. Oh, I yeah. want to stay in that minority with the Avatar, with uh, that movie Avatar that James Cameron made. Yeah. Like everyone had seen uh, it and I never had it. and I'm then I was those minorities too so I know where you're coming from I was I had to watch Avatar when I was in college for like a class I'm like no I don't want to watch it I, <laughs> I, I want to be I want to have that I want to have that be like never seen it man never seen it <laughs> Yeah, but that is me. So let's go into the album and the first thing I want to ask you James with the album was what how did you feel about that uh move to move the album from the release date on April 10th to April 3rd? Well, honestly, I thought it was a kind of a nice gesture for the band. Like we were just talking about some of the things that bands can do to kind of bring bring some hope and happiness to their fans in this desperate time. Like a lot of the bands have been doing the online concert things and another thing you can do is if you have new music coming out if just releasing it a little bit early that just kind of a little thing you can do to make things uh good for the fans so a week early it wasn't too big a deal either way but um honestly i think it was a pretty good move just for the band overall yeah outside of my being selfish for my whole entire work schedule i do have to agree with you that it was a good move by them because when it came, I mean, when it came down to it for myself, it was again, like I had August Burns Red already set up for that day. But the thing I was going to get out of it was 
was when you listen to August Burns, I mean, you're going to get that intense, heavy metalcore sound in that. Absolutely. And, and trust me on this. They did not disappoint in the slightest on that album. No, uh, their Guardians no, no. album was fantastic. I was blown away by it, too. Yeah. But then when it came to when I think about with Red, it's like, well, Red is not really in that metal scene. They're more in that hard rock scene. So mm, what, yeah. so the thing is, is the metal fans, and the metalcore fans are really going to have something to latch on to with August Burns Red. And then the, mm. the rock fans are going to maybe look at like, oh, we don't really want to listen to August Burns Red because we just don't like that hard of a style. But we want something, you know, maybe right, right. for the beginning of the month just to have released. And Red was able to fill that spot. It, but mm-hmm. the and and when you take a look at it on the on the flip side, though, it's like now you're competing with. August Burns Red on that same day because maybe some of the rock fans, if they would have kept it on April 10th, would have been like, oh, we're going to listen to August Burns Red because that's pretty much the main release for that week. But then all of a sudden the following week, Red would have been the main release. Some of those metal fans would have jumped over as well because I think that transition over from like hard rock fans to metal fans is a little it's bit it's definitely a big split there it's a big split but I think it's a harder to go from hard rock into metal than from metal back into hard rock yeah, yeah. It depends on like where you start from, but I feel like go either way, it can be proof to be difficult for like metal fans going to hard rock or vice versa in that sense. Yeah, because I can kind of attest to that a little bit as growing up, like I was always like more of a rock, hard rock, especially punk rock kind of kid. And mm-hmm, as it was right. coming into this, doing the whole entire My Song of the Day project, I respected metal fully. I really, I love Disturbed. I mean, they're my, they're one yeah. of my top bands of all time. I mean, if you look, well, I don't have the camera looking right now, but there's well, like a disturbed flag right up there that you can't oh, really see right really now. Nice. Yeah, but it's a uh, it's their special one that they when they went to Israel last year because they put their logo from Believe and they put it over the Star David because the Star David is in the logo and someone sent it to me. Cool. So I've got it framed up there. But That's so nice. like I, re- I respect Mel, but I always stuck more with that hard rock, punk rock kind of sound. Like, it's where like where you grew up from, right? Yeah. And then when it comes into metal, it's like some of that more cl- like, you know, like the more classic metal, sound, like the heavy metal, thrash metal, groove metal. Mm-hmm. I have a little bit of a tougher time getting into, but that's just my personal taste. However, I have a much easier time getting into metalcore, which I really have just due to the fact yeah. that it has that high energy that punk from that hardcore punk yeah. sound, which I really do like. So I can kind of attest to that. It's a little bit where it's a tough really to go from like that rock, hard rock roots to kind of going into sure. metal more. But like there is a way to get that done. Yeah, definitely. I can agree with you on that because what got me into the the start of the metal scene for me, uh, I've always kind of stuck more with like the hard rock sound of things. But what got me into metal was Metallica when I was 13. So I started off with that and I got into some of the older bands like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. So they have kind of a great large variety of different sounds between them like iron maiden's got the fast like power metal oh, yeah. stuff juice priest has like more like hard rock like songs like got another thing coming things like that so i kind of can appreciate all aspects of it and then what got me into metalcore was a band like Avenged sevenfold and bullet for my valentine mm-hmm. like when they like i started listening to them more often it was like okay i can kind of appreciate more of the screaming things now the high energy lower tuned guitars things like that like all of that like really came into fruition for me and i started latching onto that and when it comes to the two bands like red and august burns red when you talk about this album like red definitely has a lot of they do have like, some heavy stuff on this new record that can go like or be appreciated by a lot of metal fans, but they do still stick with that like hardcore, like rock fan base. And I can definitely hear that here. And on the other hand, August Burns Red is absolutely in their roots with the metalcore sound that just blows your face off. Oh, very much so, very much so. Cause even like for me, when it came to like going from that hard rock to metalcore kind of thing, I were like getting into that. I mean, the band that was that started that transition for me to really get into that genre was Motionless and White. And then, you okay, know, picking yeah. up other bands along the way as well, like when As LA Dying released their new album mm-hmm. back in September of 2019, uh, Kill Switch Engage, which I had seen live beforehand, but then all of a sudden, you know, listening, yes. see, listening to their album Atonement, especially the Signal Fire, because that mixture with it's Jesse Leach and Howard, jo- Howard Jones was fantastic. But then it really Absolutely. wasn't like, like the full, the full like appreciation for it wasn't complete until. Until I got to see that show with Ice Nine Kills, like that was where that that's where it came into <laughs> oh, full yeah. fruition. But when you're speaking about mm-hmm. August Burns Red, I mean, we're going to I mean, we're going to focus again on Red, but just bring up August.
August Burns right. Red. One thing I noticed about that album in particular was that, they, I mean, they just did not relent on anything when it came to that no, metalcore time. I mean, they went incredibly hard on it. And versus, and that's versus what other metalcore bands that have been around for a while have been doing, where some have been going more electronic or softer. Yeah. And bands I bring up like that for that, I mean, I mean, take a look at what Bring Me the Horizon has done, especially from uh, oh, Separate Turn. After Separate Turn, I mean, uh, shoot, well, uh, God, what was uh, it? Th- it was a throne. Uh, or, God, I can't. I'm the not, throne I'm, was the main single. Uh, I know what album you're talking about. I know. About. It's. I know. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm just blanking right now because it's not with the with the umbrella on it. I've got to pull it up real quick. It's yeah. That's the spirit. Yeah, that's the spirit. Like that was more. That was about, the one that kind of went to their mainstream metalcore sound. That, well, I think I think more Separate like was more that rock. mainstream metalcore sound because that's really what got him in there. But then all of a sudden, that's the spirit one more hard rock. Which again, I do like that sound as well. But I'm like, oh, you know, you're starting to go a little bit softer. But then when they went to I was like, oh, no. <laughs> they completely threw a curveball with that. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're a band that really kind of took that, had that Melkor sound and then went in a softer direction. Same thing with The World Alive. Uh, Amity yeah. Affliction went in more an electronic route. And then yeah. we'll see what happens when this new album comes out in the middle of May. But I've got a feeling this might be the biggest offender with Asking Alexandria. Oh, they're they released their album like it's gonna they're be coming out with another. They're coming out with one on May fifteenth. Okay, cool. I and was I, waiting for their release. But I, I listened to the le- last. Oh, God, the listen last to- you know, Alexandria album was the one that came out in the end of twenty seventeen, and that yeah. one already started that trend of them moving in an electronic direction. Yeah, but they still had a couple like uh, "Into the Fire" was one of my favorite songs yeah. from the band. It's just itself because it had a great sound to it. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like I listened to, you know, they came out there single, the violence. And I listened to, like, mm-hmm. this is what is this? And a I, remember, little bit I, I remember I put a post out on uh, Facebook. I'm like, well, which song for the violence is better? Is it the Asking Alexandria version or the Rise mm-hmm. Against the Violence version? I'm like, <laughs> and I literally like, put on the, up in the, like the little comment thing. I'm like, you guys know exactly which one I'm picking because <laughs> that's I mean, that's my second favorite song from Rise Again. So it's like <laughs> it's going to be course, really yeah. hard to beat that one. But that's then, for sure. But then you take a look at what all. August Burns Red did and it was on their previous album I mean they kept that incredibly hard sound and all of a sudden they just bring it's it's not like they you know they copied it but they brought it back and I think they went even harder on Guardians than they did on their previous release absolutely and it really I did work out well you. but then now enough with that let's really get into Red and I know you brought up earlier where they kind of did bring in some a little bit more of those like that harder sound because there were some unclean vocals from Michael Barnes in there they did oh, have a couple absolutely. of those like really hard like more metal driven style riffs yeah. and just parts of the songs but overall they really kept with that hard rock feel absolutely so, i definitely agree with that. i mean how'd you feel about that when you listen to the album like with that hard rock feel with especially with the consistency that they used it well that was one of the things i had like a little bit of critics on because i definitely felt overall they had that hard rock feel sound but i felt like a lot of the times they kind of blended in those like heavier metal sounds and sometimes it worked well, like on the one of the singles, All For You. I feel like the heavy sounds on that album or on that song definitely like really stuck out, at least for me personally. And then they have some other songs on here, like The Evening Hate was another one that was really like a hard rock song, but it's still like strong in the metal sound too. So I felt like they kind of drove the line pretty well on the different sounds. But overall, I think the album sounds really good. and their consistency with the the hard rock sound is definitely there. <laughs> that is one thing I definitely applauded Red on this album was if you listen to the songs, I mean, they just have that consistent hard rock sound that, I mean, I'm not going to say you're expecting it from them, but you're kind of hoping. For me, I was kind of hoping that they were going to make sure that that hard rock sound was still going to be in there. And throughout the mm-hmm. 10 songs on Declaration, I mean, they hit it every single time. It's very consistent yeah. with, you know, those hard rock bands that are on top of the game right now. Such as, I mean, I mean, Three Days Grace is still up there even without Adam Gantier. Uh, so like kind of like th- thinking about like you know they're still they still have that sound and it's still a good sound they went with and what I kind of liked about it was for there were points where I liked it and there's points where I didn't and some of the points I liked it and I'll bring up the singles specifically on this one so mm-hmm. like All For You and The War We Made what I really liked about those was they had that hard rock sound in there and they mixed a couple little things here and there with you know maybe a little bit more of a metal sound and then 
with the war we made i mean they mixed up just a piece in there like right before the chorus was the pre-chorus on there which i absolutely loved i couldn't get enough of it it was just the best part of the whole entire song i think it was actually the best like singular part on the album but then as i went yeah. through the other single so i'm gonna jump into the evening hate and i was listening to that song and i was really trying to go through it and something just popped into my head as i was listening i'm like this sounds like they're trying to mix their sound with the sound that Chevelle would have made, like if they would have made that song, it sounded incredibly like a Chevelle song. And I'm like, I, I I really like Chevelle's sound too. Don't get me wrong, but it just it, it didn't really stand out like this was really like that full on red song. And it will, yeah. I mean, I'll keep going through even with uh, their other one of the other singles, Sever. It was the sa- it felt like the exact same way. I mean, this is also a collaboration with Breaking Benjamin as well because I forgot yeah, which. Well, which member help him write it but every time i thought i listen i'm like this kind of reminds me of 10 years like something that 10 years would have come up. and then the chorus hits because it had that much longer drawn out chorus i'm like this is yeah this is almost is. perfect 10 years so what those songs it's like i could tell the influence in there but it just something didn't hit right where you hit those influences right but they sounded too much like those other bands now yeah, they true. did something a little bit later on or at the end of the album with uh from the ashes because i thought they right. literally took 10 the re- their style of hard rock and 10 years style of hard rock and chevelle style of hard rock and mixed all three of them together all into one song all into one and it yeah. gave this incredibly different sound that sounded more like that red sound as well because they didn't really focus in as much on those they took bits and pieces from them, and it sounded much better overall on that front so when i was listening to the singles it was i mean uh God, what was the first name of the first one again? I got to pull it up. Uh, All for you. And then the war mm-hmm. we made. I'm like, those were the ones that really stood out. The war we made, especially, which I really do want to get into with you. But and then yeah, it, we go, and then all of a sudden it's like when you what I thought was when they went with like a singular influence along with their style. It didn't really match up well because it sounded too much like the the influence than too their much sound. Like the other one versus them yeah. themselves. But then when they mixed more than one in there, like when they did Chevelle and Ten Years on From the Ash, like they mixed Chevelle, Ten Years, and the Red Sound and put it all together, they made something that sounded with a had a great hard rock sound that was more red, but with touches of like Ten Years and touches of Chevelle. Interesting. Yeah, I I don't know too much about from those artists that you're mentioning, but I can definitely agree with you from where their influences stand and how that kind of came into play when they're writing these songs. When it comes to the songs like All For You, my favorite parts about this album were the ones where the songs were consistent throughout the, the specific songs. Like for a song like All For You, like that was definitely one of the heavier songs on this album and they kept it on that line for the entire song. And the same with songs like The Evening Hate and Sever. Like those songs, The Evening Hate was definitely a heavy song and Sever kind of had that hard rock feel. I can definitely hear like influences from like Breaking Benjamin and you can kind of even hear like a band like Shinedown too in the sense that it has that definitely hard rock sound. And But the songs were consistent throughout and that's something that I definitely respect from this band uh, in particular. Like when they when they drive into their sound and they can stick with it for a whole song, I think it sounds really good. I, I mean, when it comes to that, I do have to fully agree with that for all for you. Cause I'm taking a look at my notes that I had for the whole entire, when I shot the review album, cause mm-hmm. if, when I shoot my review, my reviews for albums, what I always do is, is I'll do what I used to do and I'll review everything song by song and then do my likes, dislikes, right. final thought. But then when I do the video, I condense it so that I just focus on three parts and put them all together. But I always want to make sure I have that song by song breakdown. So right, especially right. at the end of the year when it comes, I'm like, okay, what's that like about this album? Like, why am I, mm-hmm. why is it in my top 10? Then I still have all my notes right there. That's fair, yeah. But really going into all for you because you're talking about that consistent time. I mean, I'm taking a look at what I wrote for here and I'm like, this is just a like at the end for the my instrumental part like does a great job maintaining that hard rock feel because you kind of get that yeah. like you know that more like 2000s hard rock feel especially how the guitar sounds especially throughout the song but then when the chorus comes it kind of get more a little bit of that classic rock instrumentation because it keeps the Definitely. pace and momentum of the song but it just has that little bit of a change up in there in style but not that big of a change you're going from like more classic hard rock to like that 2000s 2010s hard rock when you're kind of mixing between there you don't have to transition very much between the two and it keeps it a consistent and on a song yeah. like this because it just drove through it 
But then, of course, you're going to drive th- if you're going to drive through something like that. There's got to be something that stands out on the track as well to kind of really make it pop. And that's where Michael right. Barnes' vocals comes in because when he starts out, it's you know he starts out with a more calmer style vocal, but then it gets mm-hmm. into more of that rougher hard rock kind of vocal. And when the chorus comes, I mean, it's that classic hard rock where it's it's not unclean. It it's not unclean, but it's like a very grainy clean where it's a little bit rougher, but you're easily able to understand what's going on there. You can hear the variance in right. pitch in his voice. Definitely. Yeah. And not gonna, I mean, he did pull out the unclean vocals in the bridge on this one. And I actually really liked <laughs> it because taking a look at I, I remember I, every time I look at these albums, I'm like, OK, look at these songs. I got to find out what the meanings of these songs are. And if I don't see oh, the band yeah. talk about them, well, then I got to find out what they are for myself. And that's fair. I think from what I saw from the band was like the songs about our it's about our egos and how if we follow our ego throughout life, it's going to lead to an endless war within ourselves that we're going to fight every day between what our ego wants and what we really want in life. So when I took a look at the vocals, I mean, hearing that just unclean, like snarl in the bridge kind of really brought that anger feel to it where it's like or either, either anger of trying to fight off your ego or anger of or like the ego itself trying to win. But the cleaner vocals, yeah. and a little bit of a gr- grainier feel to them kind of had that more of a had more power to them like you know Mm -hmm. you're going to be able to beat what your ego wants you to do yeah you can definitely feel that inner struggle in his voice that they're talking about in the lyrics of the song in in the way he sings it so i definitely like how you can feel the energy in the way they express themselves in the songs i think most of that actually comes from michael barnes's vocals as well because there's a lot of vocalists that you know they can do they can do that but In this case, I mean, Michael Barnes is really hitting it consistently, mixing it between maybe a cleaner style of clean vocals to a grainier style of clean vocals. And even when he brought the unclean ones at bits and pieces. Absolutely. Yeah, because he can do it all. Like whether you're feeling a harder song, like something like The Evening Hate or All For You or something on the cleaner side, like The War We Made, like you can definitely feel the emotion in what he's talking about. Oh, oh, very much so. And uh, one another song I want to talk to you about is the third song on the album, which is called Cauterize. Cauterize. Yeah, that, that was one, that one was one that grew on me, actually. That was my favorite of the deep cuts that weren't the singles. Yeah. And the, that was that was one of the problems I had with this album was, well, for, for review's sake, I like the fact that all of a sudden, like, oh, there were a good amount of singles on this one. But for just right. listening through sake and just trying to enjoy, really enjoy it, it's like I had half the album before this even came out. Yeah. And that's something yeah. that I've seen other bands do in the past. I saw Breaking Benjamin do it. Um, yeah. August Burns Red didn't do because they had 11 songs in their album and they came out with three singles, which makes sense. Which I mean, uh, I'm, I'm okay with three songs. That's the, that's usually where I top it off. Yeah. Like I won't listen to any more than three singles or else it's, my album's kind of like spoiled, you know? Yeah. So it's like if you come out with like one, like honestly, it's like you got to come out with at least one. Two is good. Mm-hmm. Three right. is perfectly fine. Four, I'm like, okay, now yeah. you're starting to get a little bit more. Five, I'm just like, whoa, 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 you're yeah, like, don't stop go it right there. too far. Yeah. One, I mean, one thing I liked about Cauterize though was, especially in the time that we're living in right now, and with Red being having those Christian influences in their music, especially mm-hmm. in the meanings, I mean, they really went full force in on this one, especially with Cauterize because I looked at it, I looked at the lyrics, it was, you know. We have so many things in life that are trying to break us and trying to keep us down and trying to basically just dis- basically destroy us and kind of like, you know, when like having like a cut on your arm, all of a sudden it's bleeding, right. got to cauterize it. So all of a sudden it's like, you know, it stops bleeding. And I, mm-hmm. I mean, taking a look at the lyrics as well, they really kind of look towards God and Jesus for this one, which especially yeah, given, you know, what's going on with this whole entire coronavirus thing, people trying to look for a sense and, you know, maybe a sense of normalcy, sense of hope. There's gonna be a lot of people that are looking towards their faith and towards their religion. So something like this, exactly, yeah. I thought, you know, it's, I mean, anytime like a song like this comes out, like it's going to fit for someone's life at some, at that given point right. in time. But it's kind Absolutely. of, it's kind of weird to say it's kind of special that it came out at this moment in time, just due to everything that's going on in the world. <laughs> Yeah, like obviously that's something they wouldn't have been able to plan for given that song was written before. But I definitely agree with you that a song like Cauterize where people are kind of stuck right now. They don't really know where to look for. So one of the first things they'll look towards is their favorite bands and people who inspire them. And when you have a band like Red who has such a large audience and they're 
writing a song like Cauterize, which helps bring faith back to the people. That's something that I can definitely respect out of a band. Oh, very much so. And the main reason why I bring I wanted to bring this one up though is because there were there was a spot where the instrumentation shined brightly, but this song was specifically built on and I mean I know it said it you said it grew on you and one reason it really grew on me from the second time I listened to it was Michael Barnes's vocals and how they transition between the chorus and the bridge on this song. Absolutely. Because yeah. like, because like I'm taking a look at like with the chorus because they had the instrumentation like it wasn't as because especially with that hard rock sound, I mean, it's going to be deeper. It's going to drive harder. But it seemed like they right. tuned everything up a bit uh, on the chorus to give more of that hopeful sound. Something like um, kind of something like a, like honestly, like a skillet sound because a skillet's music. Yeah. There's a lot of it that like really kind of drives to inspire hope just with the sounds they work with. And I mm-hmm. kind of felt that on this one, especially in the chorus. And then you take a look at what Michael Barnes did on the vocals on the chorus. They're very clean and he doesn't go overpowered as well, just to really mix right. in well with that cleaner instrument, or that cleaner, more, you know, higher pitch instrumentation that they're working with. So it really works out in a nice, even flow. But all of a sudden you get to the bridge and you get these unclean screams over a rather hard rock yeah. instrumentation. And it works because it's, you know, this isn't something that you're like, especially with, you know, things trying to keep you down. This isn't something you're going to only go through once. And once you beat it, you beat it. Of course. And this is, it's going to be something this where over the course, of, yeah, over the course of life, it's maybe it's not, maybe it's not the same thing. It's going to come back, but things are going to keep coming at you. So it's just something where I really like the mix on that specifically. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the reasons this was my favorite of the deep cuts on this album is because I felt like the flow between the different sections of this song, they felt the best, like when it comes to consistency wise, like the flow between like the course and the bridge and like back to the kind of soaring, like melodic course that you would get in something like a skillet song versus kind of that harsh red sound that you get like later on in the song. Like I felt like that worked best in this track specifically. So I definitely agree with you on that. And I do have to agree with you as well. When it comes to the deep cuts on this album, I I know in my review, I call it out for out of all the deep cuts like this one, I call out specifically because of the vocals and how that chorus sounds and with the way it works, the bridge. So I called that out as, so I do have to agree with you. And one thing I want to just jump into is you were talking about how with this song being released, and especially with the time that we're in right now, very uncertain times and people trying to find a sense of inspiration or a sense of calmness, I would say. And they turn to their right. favorite bands and it read the fa- like big fans of the band Red, when they listen to this song, especially whether they're into the band for their hard rock roots and their hard rock sound, or whether in the band because of that Christian a Christian rock band no matter what, they're really going to feel that inspiration by the song and that sense of hope and that sense of calmness that you get from when you're listening to your favorite bands, especially in a time like this. Yeah, absolutely. Like when you have a song like this come out, like to somebody who might be struggling right now and they have one of the, a song like this come out and it's like, you know what, things might be okay. And that's something that Red can say like, I we were able to help out our fans in this tough time by releasing a song based on hope and faith. And that's something that I definitely respect out of the Christian rock community. Yeah. And I have to, one thing I'm going to jump on with that as well is lately, because of course, you know, all this, all, every single place, you know, every single gym, fitness center, whatever is closed right now. So one thing I always do is to keep up, you know, making sure I'm fit and healthy and hey, okay, the way I want to be, I've been waking up early in the morning to go and, run or to go and take a bike ride just so that I can do what I want to do, but I'm going to do it with the least amount of people around because everyone's still sleeping. So, so when we shot this podcast, when we're shooting this podcast this morning, I woke up and I went for a bike ride and lately on my rides or my runs, I mean, for the past like four or five months, I was always listening to ice nine kills because I'm like perfect for like that colder winter setting. I loved it. But all of a sudden, like I'm seeing like the sun come up and like, I'm not sure if really the horror based stuff is perfect for this kind of feel. So I started listening to like skillet on my runs and skillet on my bike rides. And today I was riding along Lake Michigan here in Wisconsin uh, because I live in Milwaukee. So I was like riding right along the lake shore in Lake Michigan and the sun was coming up over the lake and in my earbuds all of a sudden whisper in the dark comes on and i'm just riding nice. my bike i mean i'm flying down this path and all of a sudden i just look to my i was i was coming north so i looked to my right all of a sudden i'm seeing the sun come up i'm just seeing the reflection off the water and it's just 
I don't know what it was, but just like the amount, the feeling of hope that I got off of that was absolutely incredible. So when it comes to uh, cauterize, I feel like there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be able to get that same sense of hope and feeling. They can definitely have that experience from a song like this or a lot of the other songs on this record, too, for that matter. So, yeah, I definitely feel that. Oh, very much so. But I feel like I have to call out Cauterize for that one as well, because it is very much more blatant, I would say, than some of these other ones. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And one other thing I got to mention with Red, which is like why I like a lot more, like when it comes to Skillet, every like I like a lot more their stuff from uh, their comatose album on is because yes, they are Christian rock bands and yes, they really put their faith into everything, but late, but what they're trying to do on a lot more of these songs are not trying to put it out there as that soul specific purpose. It's that's going to be the purpose behind it, but you're gonna be able to draw a lot more inspiration through other exactly. things. And it's not going to be like, you know, this is going to be, Oh, it's focused on any like religious. It's focused on maybe more yourself and hope and something like that. So I kind of like that where it's, you know, it's going to have that hard rock sound. You're going to still have that message behind there, but it's not going to be as, I'm going to say just as blatant. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely add to something on that. Um, when it comes to band, Christian bands, like releasing music about their religion and stuff, like you're going to have the religion as the main message behind it. But if it's versatile enough for people to be able to draw their own meanings from it, it can kind of go into the bigger picture of faith. And I think that's the most important thing when it comes to the community as a whole because of course you're going to have the people that have that religious aspect and we can tie into that but not everybody is going to have that religious tie into it so focusing on faith is definitely something that something everyone can take something away from so it's not just one thing but you can take the main message away from it and you can kind of draw hope and that calmness sense that you're talking about from that message you get from those songs oh very much so and skillet hits that especially for for my aspect skillet hits that with everything since their comatose release and red is absolutely hitting on that on this album as well absolutely so, I definitely do that too. So on the album following Cotter Eyes, we have one of their singles, which we've mentioned a little bit about, and that's The War We Made. And personally, for my, for me, this was my favorite song on the album. The, the yes, War We Made was my second favorite. So. What, what, what was your favorite? My favorite was Sever. Okay, I, we'll, I love the hard rock sound behind that. We'll, we'll get, get to that in a minute. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I know I already cool. mentioned it was, was up with the 10 year sound that I found in it, but we will get to that yeah. in a bit. So. Yeah. When I was listening to the war we made, it was uh, this was something I've already heard beforehand because, well, it was one of the singles. So before the album was released, but God, I don't know what it was, but there was that part in the pre-chorus that just took me over the edge with this song. I'm like, this is this is the moment in that in the song where it's like the make or break moment. It's either you're going to like it or you're not going to like it. Mm -hmm. And that was the part I'm like, yep, this is this is the make or break moment. And it's the make moment on this one. Absolutely. Yeah, this song was definitely one of the strongest when it comes to the consistency behind it, too. I love how they stuck with the one style of the song for it being kind of like a softer song for them, I guess you could say. But it definitely still has a powerful message behind it. And you can hear it in the like soaring melodies that it's definitely one of the songs that are strongest and can kind of go to the largest audience, if you know what I mean. Oh, very much so. Yeah. One thing that, I mean, really stuck out to me on this was they added a little bit of extra something into their style because they start out again with that more like that classic hard rock sound. And then as Mm -hmm. they got into it, it's just the pre-course really helped the transition from that classic hard rock sound into more of that more of a brutal hard rock sound so it was harder it was greener mm-hmm. but it wasn't as like fast as rapid as something you get like in metal or metalcore so i really did like that but i think the biggest piece that really got me on this song was they included a couple of string instruments in there a couple of maybe violins or cellos. i don't i don't exactly know which i think it was more like right. i don't know which one it might have been and they also included a piano in there as well but the mm-hmm. thing that really got me about this song on that front was they didn't isolate them to a very specific part of the song. If you listen to the whole entire song with the war we made, that string instrumentation 
not from the guitars. I'm talking about like violins. Like it's yeah. throughout the whole entire thing. It might not be as prevalent, but if you li- if you <laughs> listen, if you isolate the like if you isolated every single track on that yeah. song, the by bi- like the strings would be there for every step of the way. Same thing with the piano as well, because every time I hear that, it gives that like orchestral feel to it. But also, I, I love that. Oh, I do too. And it just like increases the I'd say like the epicness of the song. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I can definitely agree with you on that because they do have that orchestral arrangement throughout this entire song. And that's one thing I do respect about Red because they have that on more than just this song. Like this song is obviously the most prevalent, but that those string instruments, they just bring out so much more than your average like hard rock song. Like you can have a song that's uh like a melodic song kind of like this, but if you didn't have the string arrangements in that, it would, it wouldn't feel as full. And that's what I love about it. It kind of fills that space that makes it feel kind of like it's other world, like rather than just like a standard song. Oh, very much so. And I mean, if you want to see some other examples, I'm going to pull out skillet again, because when it comes to them bringing in the strings, like they're perfect for this. I mean, take a listen to songs like uh, like comatose or awaken alive or rebirthing. Like if they didn't have the strings in those songs, they they would just be normal hard rock songs that really wouldn't have as much substance in there. It's just the strings brings out so much in them. And what I like about yeah. again, what I like about with uh, the war we made was they kept it consistent throughout the whole entire song, which is something I yeah. rarely ever see when bands bring in the strings. They usually bring them in for the intro or the outro on the evening. Hate they brought in the strings, but that was just for the outro, which really gave it that intro, yeah. real Same drawn out Ash, feel. Yeah. yeah. But they did that with from the ash too. Oh, they did. I completely yeah, forgot the, about that. Uh, <laughs> the last like 40 seconds of the album or whatever, I kind of found it cool because they, the first five songs ended with the orchestral like 40 second like fade out. And then the last five songs ended with the same thing. Yeah, it was very, um, it, but it, oh, go ahead. My bad. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, man. Okay. Uh, another band I can think of when it comes to the orchestral like arrangements through it, um, Linkin Park on their uh, Minutes to Midnight album. Oh, they had yeah. like, a lot of really good songs on there that used that like violins and strings and cellos throughout to make those sounds really come to life. One song I can think of right now is the shadow of the day without the like cellos and like strings on that one. That was one that really stuck out with those elements to it. Yeah. Very, very true. I know they kind of brought and like bringing up Lincoln park as well with minutes and midnight. I know they kind of brought in that more that like piano sound to really get that more like orchestral feel on a song, like <laughs> what I've done and not going to lie. I really don't care for that song overall. Where, <laughs> where I'm like on that album. I mean, for minutes and midnight, the two that stuck out to me were of course, given up, especially with that, like 17, 18 so second cool, scream from man. Chester, which I have no idea how he was even. <laughs> I able. still think that's the best metal scream in the entire scene. <laughs> well, because it has to be, well, because I'm that but take if you take a for everyone listening if you take a listen to the song again i mean he is going hard and brutal with the vocals before that and then he goes straight back to that is well his grainier cleaner style of singing right after it's like there's really no time to really catch your breath i don't know how the hell he did it but he did it and then the other one i like in that one because it has more of that consistent just rock sound to it i mean the guitar drives it is bleeded out oh absolutely that one's beautiful so like i can see what you're talking about with that orchestral part of it as well and what i like what you brought up about lincoln park with that especially on minutes and midnight is it's, it just gives fans of those bands a little bit more substance all of a sudden maybe they haven't heard red or Absolutely. they haven't heard declaration yet it allows them you know say oh it, if it's gonna be something like that that you know maybe it's not gonna be the same way but it's kind of like hey if you like that if you like that style go check this one out Exactly. And I can add on to that. Like if I was going to show somebody who had never heard of this band, like if I was going to show them and try and get them into red, I would start with a song like the war we made because it has that, those elements that you can kind of bring new people in and it's like, okay, I can get it behind this. And now you see what else they got after that. So it's definitely a good starter song for in that sense. Oh, agreed. Agree. Uh, another one I want to go into is one of the other, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going into the singles, man. All right, let's go to the next one. I want to go into the evening hate. And I know they put out a video 
for this one. They actually put out two. One is a condensed version. One's like a 13 minute long version of them wow. of the band, like either like in a war, or like breaking out a person. I have no idea what they're actually doing. <laughs> like what? The, <laughs> but it's but they're. I mean, they're like pretty much like out in the woods, out in the wilderness, and then all of a sudden they play this song. And I spoke about it earlier. How this song drive for me when I listened to it, it drove incredibly. Uh, similar to like Chevelle. There was one part that really didn't drive as much like Chevelle. Actually, two parts. One was the bridge because it was slower, but it was heavy. Like it was a slow, heavy. Uh, that was one of breakdown. the heaviest breakdowns in on this album. I remember that because it was like, like the song had a pretty like medium paced tempo throughout it, and then it just kind of stopped for a second, and then you got that like most low tempo like heavy guitars and drums pounding and it just like went off yeah that was one thing that when i listened to the song it was if there was going to be a differentiation between like that chevelle sound and the and red going for it it was going to be that (laughs) slower but just heavy (laughs) breakdown as it went through and just hit hard i mean that was something i liked and then we spoke about the ending with the strings overall where it has that like string orchestral outro where it's going to just it's going to it's going to epically bring you out of the song. Yeah, cuz it kind of like ends the first half of the album. At least I feel like that's its purpose in this sense cuz after that like 4 minutes of brutal heaviness it's like okay, here's your time to like calm down and like bring you back so you can start the next part right now, right? It's like okay, time to catch your breath. We'll see what happens. I feel like I feel like when Red finally or when this virus is over and Red finally gets back on the road, The Evening Hate is going to be a song that they're going to be able to use at the end of their sets but it's going to be it's not going to be like the last song it's going to be the song before like the two or three song encore or one song encore however many they want to do my actual introduction to this band was seeing them live because they were on a bill with in flames back in november really they did a north american tour yeah with in flames red and then it was like a local band so the first time i ever heard about this band was the day of seeing them live and they did play the evening hate from the ashes live because those were the two songs on the ep from last year so that's that was how i saw or i heard about this band in the beginning and i think they played the evening hate like somewhere in the middle they played like nine songs it was like the fifth or sixth one okay and it was really it was really cool live like that's definitely something i can say so, I, I don't remember i think i just found out about the band by by taking a look at stuff and just seeing what happened i think i featured them maybe once or twice but i never really got into them but then <laughs> earlier in the year when disturbed released their aurora acoustic album which okay i liked but i was disappointed in yeah that was that was breaking benjamin run right yeah, and the reason why I w- I liked it was because th- it was their songs and it shows the power that they have, especially right. like how good those songs can be when they play them acoustic versus when they play them live because I have seen Breaking Benjamin play an acoustic set before and it was great. But the cool, thing cool. that I couldn't stand about that one was why it was disappointing was – they ca- they said like oh they're acoustic reimaginings of the songs and yeah, it was more just acoustic really that no because I mean, I'll use Red Cold River as the prime example where it was it was acoustic but all of a sudden the drumming was the same there were a lot of double kicks in there where it just didn't yeah. fit well with the song and I mean a grant and then granted uh Ben Burley did bring in a good amount of featured vocalists like uh he did. brought in Michael Barnes for failure which yeah. is when I really got like could hear Michael Barnes's vocals really stand out because I know a uh, ben Burnley could have d- did on failure because that's one of my favorite Breaking Benjamin songs. Now here, Michael right. Barnes, it's like okay, I liked what happened here. There were other times yeah. on that album where it was uh, uh, their song "Far Away," the like the new one off of that album, right. like the only new one they had. That was fantastic. Music. That uh, was awesome. I liked that one too. And the other part of that album that I really liked was when they did "Dance with the Devil" with Adam Gontier because nice. they let Adam Gontier drive the whole song. That was, but that one was really good too. Which uh, it, let me just look up some of those songs too. Yeah. Uh, overall, I think they did some really cool things on that album. But one of my problems with Aurora was the fact that like they are acoustic reimaginings, but you still have those elements from the original recordings that aren't acoustic. And so they kind of makes it sound like it's rather just unplugged versus acoustic, which is definitely a different tone for me personally. 
Yeah, that's why, like, what I mean, why, why, pretty much like my biggest comparison to it was when Rise Against the Ghost Note Symphonies, because if you're talking acoustic reimaginings, you go there. Like, like yeah, that, like, you, like the songs, they hit the exact same, but they're so different. I mean, for them, like, mm-hmm. on the Ghost Note Symphonies, take a listen to like voices off camera or faint resemblance. I mean, faint resemblance, it's, it's a ukulele. And then voices <laughs> off camera, it's piano and it's smooth and it's calm. And that song was just a rough punk rock song at the beginning. Yeah. I was like, whoa. Like okay. that's how you properly reimagine yeah. a song in the acoustic version. One other thing I want to ask you about the Aurora album, though, before we jump back in red was uh, sure. the when they did Dear Agony with Lacey Sturm. I thought she sounded really good on that one, to be honest. I got to say that one was the one that kind of set me over the edge on disappointment. And it wasn't oh, really? because of how Lacey Sturm sounded. It was how Lacey Sturm was used in that song because mm. th- there was only one or two parts where went throughout the vocals where it was just her voice. There were a lot of times where her voice and Ben Burnley's voice were overlapping each other. And yeah. what I couldn't say about it was I'm like, you have Lacey Sturm. She has that powerful voice. And it's the it was the only uh, female vocalist that they brought in on that album. So they I definitely want, could have let her shine a little bit more. Exactly. It's 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 it's, it's yeah. nothing. It's nothing against Ben Burnley's vocals. Nothing against Lacey Sturm's vocals. It's a. What I'm kind of was this point was how they were used because I thought they could have been used so much better. Yeah, they definitely could have. I agree on that. <laughs> but then again, that's pretty much like when it came to Michael Barnes's vocal style. That's the one where I really kind of got a better knowledge of it was his feature on <laughs> Failure on the Aurora Breaking Benjamin album. Yeah. And you can definitely hear how he is like shines as like a overall vocalist, like not just the screams or anything like you hear on Declaration, but you can definitely hear how he can bring his voice and show out the emotion in it. Oh yeah, and he did that a good. No- he did that a couple of times here, like on Cauterize. I think yeah, he did that, definitely. especially in the chorus. But on a song like "The Evening Hate," I mean, any time, any way the instrumentation needed him to go, where it was like you know that you know maybe like a softer hard rock style, maybe that more like right. stand, like similar sound like Chevelle hard rock style the vocals, and then that heavy mm-hmm. unclean in the bridge. Whatever the song needed him to do, whatever the instrumentation was leading to, that's what Michael Barnes did. Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel that, and. That works kind of in good ways in most of it, but there were some times where I felt like that also didn't work as well. So. Oh, understandable, because if you do that all the time, it's like for, for the majority of times, if you're just going to follow what the instrumentation is dictating for the mm-hmm. majority of the time, it's going to work out. But there are other times where you, maybe you want to try something different just to kind of yeah. get a contrasting style in there. And I'm trying to think of a good example to bring that up with just not, not on this album, maybe on like a, something different. Cause I'm trying to think of uh because some like uh, uh, uh honestly i'm gonna use hollywood undead uh, as an example i can't be pulling this one out but on their song enemy off their new empires volume one album okay i mean yeah. if you listen to the vocals from anybody else but danny in, in like mm-hmm. when they're doing their in the you know not outside of the chorus i'll put it that way i mean these guys mm-hmm. are going ag- really aggressive yeah, and then all the, definitely... and the and the instrumentation is hard and rapid. All of a sudden, you get to the chorus, and the instrumentation and is just it's it changes up just a tidbit, but it stays just as hard, and it keeps with that consistent pace. But Danny's vocals they keep with the pace, but they completely change up that rough style, and they go a lot cleaner. Mm-hmm. And it's like when you kind of when you kind of go a little bit against the instrumentation, kind of play that contrast game between the other vocals and mm-hmm. these vocals versus the instrumentation as well. Then at times. It doesn't work, but there are times when it does. Right. But and when it, it does, it absolutely can. It shines when it does. Yeah, it shines when it works well. But there are definitely times where that doesn't work in its favor. Like when you're when you're trying to how to say this, like when you're moving in a direction with like a verse and bridge type of structure, and then it kind of goes into one of those anthemic courses that can like be kind of predictable that's that can work if it's done well but sometimes it doesn't it kind of falls flat at least in my opinion yeah there are times where it does fall flat just because i i think it falls flat most time because it's just it's expected and if it's expected and it's just like if you're expecting it and it hits and it hits it it just doesn't like it just doesn't do anything for the song so when it, yeah. like when you're trying to follow with the instrumentation and it's starting to get like maybe a little stale at points, if you keep yeah. following with it, it's 
you're either going to help the song or you're going to hurt the song with it. And the thing right. is, is if you're in the middle where it's like you're very neutral on it, that's going to end up being more towards a negative on that aspect. Yeah. However, I, I, however, that that was but for Michael Barnes on declaration, that was like the exception to the rule, though, because most of the times when they yeah. ended up pulling that off, though, they he did exceptionally well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I agree with you on that. All righty. Well, I honestly, we're going to go right. I got to go. I'm going to go into one more before we get into your favorite song on the album sever. And that is the okay. victim. And okay. I have to honestly ask you this because I want to hear your opinion on this. What did you think of them introing this song with a xylophone? That was interesting. I wasn't necessarily expecting that. That was one of those things like you can kind of appreciate them doing something different. It's not exactly what you asked for, but it's kind of cool to see them do something at least unique. So I I thought that was decent. (laughs) I didn't realize it was a xylophone. I'll be honest with you. I had had to listen to it for like two or three, like the intro two or three times. Like, is that what I think it is? Then I'm like, yep, it's a xylophone. As I listen to the song, I was thinking about it, and when it comes down to it, this is my least favorite song in the album, and it's specifically for that part. Now, just the xylophone. Yeah. Well, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna start out with this because I, I I know in my review for the video, I know I put this out there as my least favorite part, but I do say that I do respect the fact that Red tried to experiment with something that was way out of the ordinary, especially on something like this, because who the hell expects a xylophone intro, like a soul xylophone intro into a hard rock song? You don't do it. That's fair. And I do respect the fact that they did it. However, why it's my least favorite part is because it took me out of the song completely right from the get-go. So I see. unless yeah. it was going to be something like, you know, you do some weird xylophone intro and all of a sudden you go into like Savior by Rise Against, like it's going to be <laughs> really, really hard for me to get into it. That's yeah. just my take on it. And how I wrote That's it fair. on my uh, on my note sheet was, was the song intro is done on a xylophone. I really can't stand it because it takes me out of the song. And while I do respect the fact they tried something new on this one, the connotations of the xylophone, just with the way that it sounds, just kind of has like a little bit more of like an orchestral, like maybe like a, I always remember like as a little kid, like playing like the little xylophone thing. So it always had this like different sound to it. That was more like a, it, ju- it, like, like uh reminded me of like, uh, like being a little kid, like a toddler, like in my like juvenile years. <laughs> and I just said, it just yeah. didn't mix well with the song when they went into hard rock right after that. It could have potentially yeah. worked had the transition from this soul xylophone intro Mm-hmm. gone into that hard rock sound the transition was better but this transition was real abrupt and i just was like this yeah. is just taking me out of it right away yeah that's one thing i felt with this song as a whole like on other songs on this album i've been talking about like the consistency and how like different parts flowing together is important on this album but this was one of the songs where i felt like that really wasn't the case because a lot of the parts on this album or a lot of the parts in this song in particular were just didn't feel like they like crossed over well at all like i think the first half of the course they had like two lines where it was like kind of clean vocals and then the second half is just this abrupt like scream from the top of his lungs and i felt like whoa where the hell did that come from yeah i did like the chorus on this one though if there was a standout moment it was that chorus i mean stand out positively because he mixes more of that hopeful and clean vocal sound that we heard in like the chorus on cauterize but then he also yeah. mixes that unclean vocal in there at times because it's not like the it was different from like in the verses when it was just like that abrupt and kind of took you out of it it was this was a little bit mm-hmm. this was tra- this was slow this was like kind of built into it because it was you got yeah. that unclean vocals right at the end so i liked how that build was done especially from that cleaner to all of a sudden you know they slowly kind of went towards it and then they, it was like an exponential curve it was like they're slowly slowly and then poof, right to it yeah yeah but it's just i god it was that xylophone took me out of this <laughs> song so fast oh, well, sometimes that happens. Like, there's just a certain characteristics. Like, nope, can't do this. Yeah, and on, and I mean, honestly, when it comes down to it, I mean, like, there's like, if that's like the worst thing I've heard from this album was like an intro to a song. Can't complain too much, right? No, you can't really complain too much because that's <laughs> not the worst thing that could have happened. I mean, it could have been something like sure. I'm trying to think of like another album that I or an album I really didn't like oh. this year, like the Word Alive's new album from this year. Because I was like, they're oh, really God. like I'm I was idiot. like, it was like it was not like my thing was these songs were so much softer than anything they'd ever done before, and it's just they yeah. didn't mix well at all. And I'm like, 
Now I'm talking about the whole album. I went to, I'll take a look at Emily <laughs> Afflictions as well. And it was softer, more electronic. And it's like, this is the consistency throughout the whole album. This isn't the mm. deviation from the norm. It's like when, when right. it's not the deviation from the norm and I'm calling it out, it's like, um, maybe yeah. this ain't the best one in my opinion. However, if yeah, I'm calling out Red for an intro into a song that took me out of it. And that's the worst thing I'm saying about it. Not too Can't bad. really complain too much. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. I know there are some songs where they just have a certain characteristic that I just I can't do it with the song after that. But overall, yeah. it's like if that's the worst yeah. thing about it, then it's not the end of the yeah. world. But then there are other songs, too. I'm going to use other examples from other artists where they have a certain characteristic on the song that just like really brings it to the forefront and is like the, the characteristic that it's an interesting song, but it's just this one characteristic that really brings it home for you. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll use I'll use one song and bring up two separate parts on it. And it's, it is the end from ice nine kills a song. That's all about uh, Pennywise, the clown and Stephen King. And the reason why it stands out on two fronts is the intro. Cause it has that like creepy core, like creepy, like circus intro. And then mm-hmm. you're going into the whole entire first scene of, of uh, Stephen King's it with uh, Georgie's boat going down the, the sewer. I'm like, okay, that like, that really kind of like, stunned me a little bit but then it brought into it and then all of a sudden throughout the whole entire song i mean you're getting trombones and trumpets to play to really get that circus feel but it's you're mixing with the a metal yards yeah, yeah, and dead, just, right? yeah and i'm just listening I'm like like that would like there's a couple couple of times where it's like you know for people it might be that moment like okay that might be the one instance in the song like that one aspect that might like completely break it for you and for me it was the exact opposite I'm like that's what made that whole entire song was yeah. you made a metalcore song Sound like it was in the circus. I love that so much. And I do like call out that song for being great in that sense, too. Uh, The other one I can think of in that regard is um, a Metallica released a song in the 90s called Low Man's Lyric. And they used an instrument called a hurdy-gurdy, which is like this weird, like... I don't even know how to describe it. You have to listen to it. It kind of sounds like a music box almost, but it's doing this weird thing. It's something, it's really strange, but a lot of people didn't like that instrument in that song, but I thought like, this is really cool. Like if they could keep doing stuff like this, like I definitely respect that. Yeah. And again, we're just bringing it and we're bringing these up as examples of like the, the songs that we heard where all of a sudden there was a completely different part of the song, like that make or break moment for that song where those make or break moments ended up making it for us. Whereas in the victim here with Red, that was like they had a make or break moment with the xylophone. And for myself, that broke me completely on it. Yeah, that's fair. It happens in all, <laughs> in all types of music in that case. <laughs> All right, Mike, I want to go through one more song with you, and I think you know exactly what song I want to go through. Yeah. Let's go through Sever. So you said this was your favorite song on the album, so take it yes, away. It is. Why is it your favorite? Well, I I knew from the moment I heard this song as it came out as a single, it's like this is probably going to be my favorite song on the record, and that's just because something about it like kind of hits – home for me and and not in the lyrical sense or anything like that but just kind of the sound of it i'm a huge fan of like modern hard rock sound of music so like this kind of started with that like main riff and i'm I'm just listening to that it's like it's so strong and one thing i want to mention about this song too and the album as a whole is the production on this is outstanding like this album sounds amazing so i love the contrast between like the kind of cut back vocals on like the verse section to this song and how the course kind of soars like it does in the war we made. So I just love how the elements work together. And then it kind of gets a little bit heavier in the bridge too, with he has that scream like halfway through the bridge and goes back into the pre-chorus. I just, the structure is great. The, the guitars do it all like the awesome work riff wise the drums in this song are amazing too and michael's barnes vocals just top it off it's like the icing on the cake i just i love this song i, I do have to call michael barnes vocals on this one as a high point because in this one in comparison to some of the other songs on the album he played with a little bit more of like a higher pitch tone and ended up being a lot cleaner on this song than he was on a couple of the other ones so it was that was a little bit of a differentiation there. However, I did talk about the song earlier where I wasn't the biggest fan of it because it reminded me a lot of like a song by 10 years. 
And it was just mm-hmm. that, and I brought out earlier where it was, they mixed their style kind of with like a style that 10 years would have gone with. And it just, I think they just sounded a little bit too much like 10 years. And I mean, I do like the harder intro of the guitar because it doesn't hit the notes too quickly. Like it's not that like rapid pace, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. like it hits up yeah. hard, but it's just not as quick. It's like, dude, 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 kind of, you know, it's kind of like a slower pace. Uh, I like that. About yeah. It. But then all of a sudden, like jumping to the verse, and like the first verse, I'm like, I just kept seeing the 10 years influence because, uh, it really isn't like if they had like just a softer sound to it and a little bit on a higher scale. I was like, okay, this is interesting. All of a sudden, I heard the chorus on this one, and I was like, God, what song by Ten Years does this remind me of? Like, I I knew it. And I looked at. It, I'm like, this reminds me of Fix Me by Ten Years. So when I was listening to that, I'm like, it just the th- the thing was I could hear that influence in there heavily, and I just couldn't get it out of my head throughout the whole entire song. Yeah. There was really nothing that really brought it out of my head like all of a sudden like okay we're gonna change it up kind of thing so that's why i had a little bit of an issue with sever that's understandable and that can happen again too like when you if you hear something else in a song like you won't be able to unhear it i find that when i try and write my own music like if i write a part that sounds anything similar to something else i'm thinking of at the time it's like i can't use this anymore because it's the same thing so i know what you mean by that for sure yeah it's it's something where i mean i i've never i played drums for like two three years when i was a kid or three four years when i was a kid but i never really wrote my own music so i'm not understanding of that aspect however i can see where that comes in because even if you know you're trying to do something and you think it sounds way too similar to something you're thinking of right now. It's like, oh, you know, yeah. I'm writing a song and all of a sudden I've been listening to a lot of Avenged Sevenfold. All of a sudden, you know, right. we write it and all of a sudden I start playing. I'm like, this doesn't sound like me. This sounds like Avenged Sevenfold. Um, exactly. It's like, okay, yeah. I got like, to change it up now. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes artists can fall into that trap a lot and they definitely use their influences because everybody has influences no matter what you're writing about. But sometimes if they come into the highlight of the low light, you, if someone else recognizes that, that's something that can definitely come into play when you're listening to the song for the first time. Oh, yeah. And the other thing, too, is, is I mean, this also comes from people, too. I mean, one of the, there's a very famous saying, like, you are a combination of the five people you spend the most time with. Of course. So it's kind of yep. like, I mean, think about it, like if a band, it's like you're a combination of like the five the bands five you listen, listen to listen the to. most. So it's, I yeah. mean, but then again, one thing that's going to happen too is as there, as careers have gone on, it's, you're going to end up generating a specific sound and use a couple of examples. Yeah. I'll use three days grace as an example, because when you, that's when they fun. started out with that, with their debut album, it was, they, I mean, they sound like a lot of different, a lot of hard rock bands around that time. Like, you know, like see their, I uh, had a little bit yep. of like a new metal influence in there as well, but it was something different just because of uh, like, there was always like a little bit of a discerning quality, especially within Adam Gantier's vocals. All of a sudden you jump yep. into one X and it's like, this is like three days, grace, hard rock. So yep. I'm sure. And so, and as time is, as time goes on, it's just these ba- breaking Benjamin's another one where it's like, this is yep. like the, that alt metal sure. style. It's like, I listen to a, yeah. a couple bands. I'm like, I start comparing them to the breaking Benjamin sound. So it's yeah. a thing where, when we're when I'm comparing bands like, oh, yeah, it's like you're going to use your influences over time. All of a sudden, then you're going to be you're going to have you're going to end up really generating your own sound. You're still going to take influences from those other bands that you listen to. You're going to generate from that from your own sound. But then uh-huh. other bands are going to take influence from what you did. Exactly. So it, it's kind of like an end, like a continuous cycle that way. Like you're always like trying to take influence from bands that you love and influence or love and like listen to from. But at the same time, you always want to try and like innovate and kind of come up with something new. So so that's why sometimes you get different ideas, like adding a string arrangement or something a little more less on the contrary. But overall, like you always want to try and kind of become more of yourself while still like maintaining your consistent sound. And I think the bands that do that the best are the bands that are most successful. Oh yeah. One band I want to bring up with kind of the, one of the bands I've been, I've talked to has been staying the canvas. And one thing I always thought about them was like, I listen to their sound. I'm like, this is like that. Bring me the horizon metal core sound. And it's like, if they kept like after separate Eternal, if they kept down that route, instead of going the route that they right. did, like they had that sound. But then the thing they had added to it was this, more orchestral like you know like latin epic music sound i'm talking latin like the language latin so i'm like oh, wow. i'm like just adding that all to it and then they're god their lead singer has this just snarl that when he does some of these unclean vocals i'm just like whoa here we go <laughs> but it's like but it's like yeah. of course starting out it's like when people aren't nest when you know your your music isn't aware to the masses 
it's you're going to end up getting compared to other bands because that's where the comparison comes through. All of a sudden, you know, next year, five five years later down the line, there's going to be another new crop of bands coming up and people are going to be comparing them to your sound because exactly. that's yeah. because it's that's just what happens. It's it's a cycle. Yeah, five years before that, uh, you were that band was listening to that band. And then it's like, all right, we're going to write like this band now and people will pick up on to that. Right? And especially like anywhere within rock and metal, it's like, well, with with rock music, it's like you can kind of go all the way back, like to like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and of even course, earlier yeah. for there. And then when it comes to metal, you pretty much can go all the way back to Black Sabbath and then everything yeah, kind of branches off after that. Yeah, you can always trace the roots all the way back down. Oh, yeah, you can. All righty. Now, here's the big question, James. So Declaration by Red. If you have to rate this album, which I'm going to ask you right now, on a scale of one to ten, what are you giving it? And you can give it half points, quarter points, whatever kind of points you want. I'm going to do probably a solid seven out of ten. All righty. I've one thing I found out about this, like every single time I'm talking to people, because I'm looking at my rating right now that I have on there. Every single time I talk to people, like I'm still really consistent with whatever everyone else is. Like, I'm really around there because I had this as a six and a half. Nice, nice. Yeah, because overall, like I didn't like every single song in this album, but I like parts from everything. And the songs that I liked, I liked a lot. And there were definitely some solid parts on here that I will definitely be coming back to and songs I'll consider for my end of the year playlist that I always make. I always do a 50 songs at the end of the year. So I definitely consider some songs on here for that. And overall, the album sounds great at production wise. And there's some great standout tracks on here. So seven out of 10 is good. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of the quick hits for why I'm going for six and a half, because for everyone else, if you're, if you want to find out like the whole entire album review on my standpoint, you know, as well as like with what we just did with James here, you can watch a YouTube album review. It's going to be out well already because I'm releasing the podcast the day after the album review <laughs> comes out. But what I said about this album was this is an incredibly consistently good hard rock album. The production is gr- really good. Michael Barnes's vocals are, you know, the stand probably if there's gonna be anything stand out on this album, it's gonna be Michael Barnes's vocals for the consistency of them and how well they did. But the thing that really got me to not push this album to like from that good to great status was I really didn't find a moment on this album that I call like the dare to be great moment where everything was consistent. They really kept and we know that they're a great hard rock band and they hit on so many different tropes. But when I look at like the best, my favorite song there, which was the war we made and I look at I'm like, it's it's good. It's really good. But it's I don't think it's going to be something that when I listen to it, I'm going to end up coming back to it at the end of the year saying this is a top 10 song over some of the albums that I've really liked so far this year. Taking a look at some of the songs on them, like Polaris's new album this year, the song above oh, my, the song, the song so above my head. I remember listening to that thing for the first time. I'm like, and I listen, I'm like, it's good. Like, I like this. All of a sudden I listened to it again and it just blew me away. I already mentioned Hollywood Undead's Enemy. That was one for me. And then an album that's coming out, I believe in June from the band Make Them Suffer. They've got one single out right now and it's called Erase Me. And Ooh. Holy shit, just from hearing the intro on that, I knew I was like, this is going to be an album I might have to review, but I got to listen to this whole entire song and make sure. Like, the, the crazy thing is, like, they only have one single out, and I can tell that's their <laughs> Dare to Be Great song, and it is fantastic. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. That I, sounds awesome. I would, but when I'm saying, you know, Red on Declaration had this really good, consistent hard rock sound, that's not a knock on them. That's something that a lot of bands strive to have is that consistent sound that when you hear it, you know it's going to be good, and Red really did hit on that. I didn't think this was over the moon stellar, but in terms of, you know, was it good, was it great good okay bad really bad i mean this is good this is good stuff yeah definitely and red's been a band long enough now that they have definitely developed their style so they can they're definitely comfortable in the sounds that they are they know that they can do well so i think overall as a red release this is a pretty good album like for them as a whole yeah so i fans that really do love the band are absolutely gonna love this album fans that are not well no, that aren't well you know well versed with red when they listen to this album they're gonna like it because they're gonna really like the consistent hard rock sound on it so this is something Absolutely. like you just said where they have their own sound that they've developed over the course of almost 20 years and 
it shows that they're consistently good at what they do. I mean, there's there's no there's no absolutely. going around that fact on this album. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on that. <laughs> so, yeah, dang, that was red. Uh, just because we went through the whole entire red album. Uh, what did you? Overall, just a qu- on the quick hit with August Burns Red's Guardians. Did you have a chance to listen to that whole entire thing? <laughs> yeah, I listened to that. I think Friday night. Oh my god, that album was absolutely insane. I listened to that album, and the the only thing that I had a little bit of a trope with with that album was something that I know a lot of people are going to applaud, and it was just how consistently how consistent the vocals were just constantly using that unclean style where yeah that was i'm gonna say this Go ahead. overall i think it was the right move again given the fact of all the other metal a bunch of other metalcore bands that are really going softer in the genre and yeah. i like the fact they kind of just went full force with the hard like going full hard with the uh with the uh the unclean vocals however it just it kind of put the whole entire album like into a little bit of a box, not a not like a strict box, but like a loose box, just because <laughs> I was hoping for a little bit of the uh, cleaner vocals in there. And I'm not talking, you know, like a whole section. Like if they just done like bits and pieces, like from one of their singles, Bones, when they hit begin the chorus, when they just have this clean, just hard sound with that, it's in our bones from the whole entire band. Mm-hmm. Like that stuck out to me like none other. So I absolutely, absolutely love that. Yeah. The instrumentation on it, I'm, oh man, they just went hard and it was it was great. <laughs> One, I gotta, I gotta applaud the guitarist on that one because oh, absolutely, they, the guitar drove so many different emotions without, <laughs> like those songs would have driven all these emotions without the without without the vocals, and it was all based no, on the guitar. I was yeah. like, now that I was like, now if there was a dare to be great situation for August Burns Red, that's what they went with. With okay, we're gonna have all these unclean vocals, we're gonna keep this hard, but how do we drive emotion on these songs? Let's change the guitar, let's up tune it, let's maybe you know get some like you know a little bit more of like a depressed style to it let's see what this does to really change the emotion of the song that's their dare to be great situation and they hit it i mean they freaking hit it yeah like this album as a whole was definitely like non-stop like hard all the way through and my it was funny because my introduction what you're saying about the instrumentation of this album and how that's like being great my intru- my introduction to this band was actually through their christmas album oh, and really? uh carol of the bells their instrumental of that like the metal version of that song was my introduction to august burned red and I'm like wow this is amazing <laughs> I'll say, Dora, my introduction to them was seeing them live at Summerfest here in Milwaukee because one of my friends wanted to go see them. I said, well, Silverstein's playing before them, and this is a metalcore band. Yeah, let's go. Why not? I hadn't even listened to them at this point. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was the story when we were there because at Summerfest, they have benches all over the ground. And to mosh, it's not really good to mosh and there's a bunch of benches on the ground. So we no, tipped them up. Really. Fair enough. <laughs> did, uh, did, uh, security didn't like that. August Burns mm-hmm. Red liked it, but they told us to, you know, let the security put him down because, well, for safety reasons. They we're like, it's going to be safer if we hold him up. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I swear, I almost tore my ACL six or seven times during that show just by wow. getting knocked over the benches. And I wasn't, even, and I wasn't trying to mosh at that because I'm like, it's just too dangerous. And it's just, I just <laughs> yeah, kept getting like knocked. You're benches above your head. <laughs> well, well, I mean, this was before. This is when the benches were still on the ground, though, because, like, you know, you get pushed off. Because like people are standing mm-hmm. on top of the benches, but if I was like in the little part between the uh, the front, the first bench, and then the guardrail up to the stage, because that's where people are really trying to go nuts. Because I was standing on yeah. that first bench, it was like I want. I end up jumping down off that first bench and stood behind, so that you know, in case like people got pushed over, like I could catch them. But the problem was, was so many people were getting pushed over into me, like I was falling backwards, <laughs> and then my legs were getting caught on the benches. So all of a sudden, you know, your God. legs are bending over, and I I I remember like I. I like I could have torn it six or seven times. There was one time I came super close to I could feel my That's knee so twisting bad. to the side. I'm like, okay, this is gonna be fucking bad. And I literally just had to yeah. put I literally threw my leg up, my other leg up as much as I could on a bench just to stop myself. I'm just like, okay. Okay. And I like kind of like slowly it? turn it back and like, oh, oh dear God. God. And luckily it was at the end that of the was, song. It was at the end of the song too. So thank God. Otherwise. Literally. Otherwise, that I mean, I would just be really, get, really bad. I otherwise, I'd probably just be getting done with ACL stuff because that was at the end of June last year. Wow, yeah. <laughs> it was not, yeah. not good. 
damn. But yeah, with the guitars on this album, like Guardian Fire for Red, I love how they like tune the guitars differently. Like it was a big variety. Like sometimes they had some six string stuff, like you, what you see with Kill Switch Engage do or something like that. Um, but they also had some like lower tuned stuff too. And I just loved how they had like the big variety behind it. So even though you're having nonstop metalcore, you're still getting a difference in sound between your songs. Oh, very much so. That, and that's that was the again, like I said, that was the dare to be great situation on that album, and they hit yep. it. So I absolutely right after I listened to that whole entire thing, did my review. Oh, I had my computer up because that's where I do all my stuff. Open up my nice little Microsoft Excel spreadsheet with my page, with my file 2020 year end awards. I'm like, all right, nice. Guardians, August Burns Red. All right, that's on the list for best of the year right now because I always do 10. And right now I'm keeping a running that's total. Awesome. So all of a sudden, if all of a sudden I get like a fifth or a, like if for the ones I have 10 on, all of a sudden, what happens if I get an 11th one? Now I got to figure oh, out. Damn. It's And I don't, <laughs> the thing is, is I don't have them in ranked in order right now. I just have them on right. there. But all of a sudden, like, yeah. If I have one come on there, it's like, okay. You're going to have to cut one at some point. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try, I'm going to take a look and see which one of the like top, like for the best albums, like which one of the top 10 am I thinking is the weakest out of this one? And then right. I'll compare it to the one that I just heard. And if the one I think is the weakest wins, it's going to stay on in the list. If it's, right. if I don't think it's going to win, it's going to go to the, it's going to go back into like a relegation point to say it was on the list That's at one it. point. Cause I might have to revisit right. it at the end of the year, but all of a sudden this one's in there. Cause right <laughs> now, like a whole set of playoffs for it. Yeah. Cause right now for best song and best album, those are the two that I have 10 picks for. And I've got, Seven oh, picks. Ten albums already? No, I mean that's that's how I do it. I have seven picks for albums right now, and oh, I've got okay. eight picks for songs for my worst album of the year. I've got five picks. Most disappointing album of the year. I've got five picks, and I only do five on those. Most surprising album of the year. I always have five picks. I've got three, and worst songs. I always do five, and I've got oh, I've got five right now. Cool. Cool. Oh, God. I, I'm, I'm looking. I'm like, there's one that definitely I'm thinking is number one. But all of a sudden, I heard one that recently I'm like, oh, that's going to be a tough one. You're going to have a competition between those two. I don't have a competition between, but I think one of them is going to end up. I think the one that I had originally on there is like right now, like thinking of like the number one spot for worst song of the year is going to keep it because the one I have for number two, I couldn't stand. But there was a feature on there that might mm-hmm. save it from being number one. That's fair. I just want to say one thing about your list. Like the top song of 2019 last year when you chose Popular Monster, I was so surprised by that. Really? <laughs> I was. Like it was on my list for the like top 50 songs of the year, but it only made like top 30. Like it was like the 20 second slot or something like that. It's like you chose that as number one. That's insane. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, well, because it came out like. It came out a couple days before. It came out like a week before Thanksgiving. So it came here in the US. So like November 20th. I had a lot of people bringing that up to me. They're like, this song came out close to the end of the year and it just overtook mm-hmm. everything else. And I looked and I said, yeah, it did. Because <laughs> I still remember, I still remember when it came out too, because I got the notification on my phone from uh, on Instagram that all of a sudden it was like, oh, uh, it was like falling in reverse posted something I'm like okay let's just check this out because they never get notifications like that from bands all of a sudden like right. a new song i said okay well ever since they kind of started going with the single stuff like losing my like losing my mm-hmm. life losing my mind i really was like oh it was okay i like losing my life i like losing my life more and then when they came out with drugs i was like i liked what they did on drugs and then all of a sudden with that Corey mm-hmm. taylor feature out of nowhere that no one expected that, it was like that was amazing it was like okay wow all of a sudden i'm like okay let's listen to pop and mind sleep it goes on that upward trend and then mm-hmm. it started out and it was like a more sinister rap style like a deeper darker yeah. i'm like okay this is something as we got as the end of the chorus i really liked it but i'm like i just I'm like, I hope it doesn't like stay this consistent because I like its right. beginning, but it's got to build on it. And all of a sudden, yeah. as it goes, it's like, it hear that, cool. okay, motherfucker, now you got my attention. It's like, uh, okay, okay. You go to the chorus <laughs> and I'm just like, this is good, but it needs something else just to be great. And then you get that metal core <laughs> bridge and it's just like, the break. Oh, what the fuck insane. is this? <laughs> then, then you get they get a little part of the instrumental from the uh, bridge and you hear the where the fuck is your god now and you get that just incredibly hard breakdown. I was I was at work at, at my full time job and I had I was watching the music video too for it. I I mean I stopped. I was looking down at it just with my mouth open like what. <laughs> 
And then at the end of the uh, oh, at the last part of the chorus, when he has when he hits the we're falling when Ron Reiki hits we're falling apart in a much higher tone, and just a much more mm-hmm. emotionally gut wrenching tone. I I remember at the end of the video, I turned off my phone and I just kind of like sat there for five minutes thinking, <laughs> what in the actual fuck did I just hear? Like wh- it, what what the hell was like what the hell? And so I listened to it like another one more time, then again, yeah. then again, then again and again. I'm like. <laughs> this went from being like a song I'm like this could potentially fit in the top 10 to all of a sudden everything about it from the perfect transitions everything that was put in I'm like this might be number one the uh, best song of the year and, like, I, and wow. I put it in there and this is something from like after I heard In the Deep from Alter Bridge which I absolutely love every part of that song I'm like I thought that, that I, thought was nothing, I was like nothing's gonna beat that one all of a sudden it's like right. what the shit is this <laughs> who would have thought that falling in reverse haven't released an album in three years to come out of nowhere and just win everything with that one song it was a great song don't get me wrong oh i i mean you take a look at like all of a sudden like you know uh youtube like statistics is a it's just all of a sudden it's like 16 million he's just he it's go and it's not like it's just like it's going up consistently it's, it hasn't leveled off yeah. it just is like i mean like yeah. you know right away like hit like three four million views and then it Absolutely, like leveled yeah. off and all of a sudden just like that level increase is just Kept still going, going. And going, and going it's still going it's like, and going it hasn't my stopped. friends who are into like rap and hip-hop like noticed that song it's like yo this is cool it's like all right i'll check it out <laughs> and i listened to the whole thing for the first time it's like damn this is something else <laughs> one of my favorite things to do is watch like the reaction videos on that song especially oh. when the bridge and the breakdown it's just like i, I love watching people no lose one was their mind expecting that no no <laughs> I, mean, I mean i mean i think we were expecting something a little bit crazy especially after drugs with what the whole entire Corey taylor uh, bridge feature like it's, that was awesome so yeah, i think we were expecting something hard but we weren't expecting it to go hard we like we're not that. prepared like that not at all no and it, it was well worth it i mean and that was going up against songs like in the deep from alter bridge that one went up against the signal fire from uh from kill switch engage sirens from saint Sonia. i'm like this yeah. thing just is blowing these out of the water and it's something where i'm still listening to it over and over and over again and i it's it i mean it's been it's been almost it's, five it's months I'm not, I, I can't it's not getting old on me yet which is really surprising oh. Oh. yeah that song is really amazing my top pick for uh album and song of last year was the in flames album i okay. mask uh that was i don't know what about that album but i just loved it so much i thought there were so many great songs and that kind of got me more into the metalcore sound too i just thought that album was so fantastic yeah i think mine was uh mine was walk the sky from alter bridge that was my that was what i thought was the best album of the year just everything about this it was it was constructed almost perfectly i mean you couldn't really i thought you couldn't really beat it and it was just Oh man, I, I have to, and then I saw them live uh day after Valentine's Day. So on eight, February 15th, I saw them uh Alter Bridge live. Well, this is before all the virus shit hit and Yeah, yeah. I think for like half the show, I was just staring at Mark Tremonti's guitar cuz I just wanted to see how, I'm like, how the fuck is he doing this shit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is like they got some really talented musicians in that band, man. Oh yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to ask Kelly Oh God, yeah, Miles. It's it's hilarious listening to Miles Kenny just speak normally because he's yeah. he, he kind of sounds like that like he kind of sounds like the IT guy at your office. Yeah, literally. But then you hear him sing, it's just like what the shit. <laughs> How do you have that voice? Yeah. Alrighty. So I also want to ask you this question uh, because we know we've talked. We're talking new albums. We talked all about Red's declaration. We went a little bit into August Burns, Red's Guardians. And uh, then we got a little bit onto this 2019 year end stuff. Loving talking about Popular Monster because I can't get enough of that song. So right now we're three months through the year, a little bit more than three months through the year. What song, what albums are on your radar as the best albums of the year? Of what have come out so far, what I'm looking forward to. Uh, What have come out so far in 2020. Okay. So I got, I do have a list here on, cause I keep a, 2020 music playlist just to keep we, track of all the essential songs for the whole year right now um the album by fight the fate and love and hope and peace they're a smaller band but they were one that caught my eye and there are a lot of good songs on that album so that's definitely one i'm looking out for um definitely the polaris album oh yeah oh yeah that, that's on mine too that, you recommended that to me and i'm <laughs> so glad you did because that album just kicks so much ass i love it so much uh, I love the new Ozzy Osbourne album. Okay. That one was really good in my opinion. Um, 
And other than that, I think probably Guardians by August Burned Red, the one that just came out. All right. Right now for me, I've got seven on the watch list right now. I've got Cello from Apocalyptica. That was the first I reviewed this year. Nice. Um, Otherwise, I'm trying to see what else. I've got 2020 Vision from Anti Flag. Again, I love punk rock, and that one just had that raw. It, for for the for the first nine songs, it had that raw punk rock sound that I absolutely love. And then the last two, they experimented a little bit, and it went really well in my opinion. Uh, New Empire Volume One from Hollywood Undead. God Made Hell from Stain the Canvas, smaller band that I've spoken to on the podcast, spoke to you about. Uh, uh, the Death of Me from Polaris, of course. Uh, Art of Being Human from this other uh, Italian alternative metal band called E-Line. Fantastic. Their lead singer. Unclean vocals like Tim Lambesis from As I Lay Dying. Clean vocals like Miles Kennedy from Alter Bridge. It's ridiculous. That's a good mix. Yeah. And then Guardians from August Burns Red. Those are the seven awesome. that I have on my watch list right now. Uh, nice. Do, do you have any others like what you're looking out for? Like, okay. So what other ones coming forward in 2020 are you looking out for? whether they might be for the good or for the bad? Well, for the good, I can start with um, one release I'm really looking forward to is the new Trivium album that's coming at the end of this month. Oh, yeah. The first two lead singles were so good, and I've just gotten so heavy into Trivium recently. I just can't wait for new music by them. Um, the other one that's on my watch list to be good is uh, the Lamb of God album. Okay. I think that one will be pretty good as well. And um, you mentioned that... Uh, Asking Alexandria was releasing a new album. I don't know how I'm going to feel about that one. So I'll, I'll probably have to dive deeper into some of their singles to figure out like just where they're trying to go. Cause I don't know what their new direction is. So that it's, one will be kind of a wild card for me. It's, it's soft, man. It's soft. I'm just going to tell you that right from the outset for, for me, it's uh, the new trivium album is one I'm looking forward to make them suffers album coming out at the beginning of June, especially after that erase me lead single. Holy shit. Am I looking forward to that? See what they can come up with in terms of the like come, expecting to come out. And I'm think it's not going to go out very well. I'm going to put asking Alexandria's in there as well. I'm hoping that they come somehow surprising, but after the, the two mm-hmm. singles and then the uh, violence from last year. I am not really ex- not expecting too much. Yeah. From- and then the one that's a wild card for me right now that I'm super nervous about yeah. is uh, whenever we finally get a data remembers new album. Oh, yeah. That one's going to be interesting. I feel like they're going to go on the electronic route, too, as well as a lot of the other metalcore bands. But it'll be interesting to see how they implement that into their style. Yeah, because they've kind of got more of that like mixture between metalcore and pop punk. And they did that very well. I mean, yeah. I mean, everyone loves Homesick. There's there's no doubt yeah, about one it. One of the most interesting crossovers I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, but it worked out so well. But then you take a look at their, oh, yeah. their last album, Bad Vibrations, like a song like uh, Paranoia. Yeah, Paranoid or Paranoia, whichever one it is. It's it's one of the two. But you guys, don't, everyone will know what I'm talking about. But like, if that's the kind of song I was like, I really want them. The sound I really like from a day to remember because it has that like pop punky kind of chorus. But then yeah. it's just brutally hard in the verses. <laughs> and you always get that one part. And, you know, you always get that one part like. At the, to start the breakdown with like all of a sudden you know like with Mr. Highway it's like you know the disrespect your surroundings I'm oh. pairing you get the I am your breaking point and it just goes hard and oh was that fun to watch too when I saw him live oh, it was so much bad. fun that must be so cool there's still so many bands I have to see live <laughs> one one I would uh, I'll bring up as well because that was the, it was the last concert I got to see before the virus and everything hit was the uh, we're alive escape the fate falling in reverse one when they did when oh, falling in reverse did the drug is, or the whole drug and me is you album but I love how they did it because it was they did the whole album and as right as they ended the album all of a sudden Ronnie come walk right as he's walking off stage she's like that was the drug in me is you in reverse and because they literally did it from back to front i'm like okay that's, that's so perfect cool. and <laughs> i mean that was a show I'm, that was a show i thought i broke my nose and i was gonna be real pissed not because oh, i thought yeah. someone broke like because someone came in with a flying elbow right at the beginning of the oh, bridge with yeah. the yeah here we go again motherfucker someone hit me with a flying oh. elbow and i knew right when where the fuck is your god now is gonna come i knew we were setting up for a wall of death and i wanted to be a part of it so bad but i thought someone because mm-hmm elbow hit me i heard the hollow noise i'm like oh, fucker God. just broke my nose and i was moving my nose like this i'm like this doesn't hurt at all and i was like this doesn't hurt at all <laughs> i looked checked there was no blood and all of a sudden the guy next to me was like you good i'm like yeah he's like 
okay, get the fuck over here. You're, you're leaving this, you're leaving our side of the wall. I was like, you better fucking believe I am. Yeah. So like all of a sudden it's getting built up. I'm just like going like this, like. Oh, that's so cool. I, I, I think I just demolished someone when I, when we, when the, when the wall hit, like I came through and it was just, I saw somebody and I just kind of turned my shoulder a little bit and just boom. <laughs> <laughs> you take that motherfucker. Well, I mean, I almost got uh someone almost tried to fight me for uh the shirt that I was wearing. Oh, what shirt sure were you wearing? Um give me one sec because I'm actually gonna pull it up real quick if I can <laughs> find it. It's gotta be here somewhere. Oh, found I found it. So So uh, Falling in Reverse Escape the Fate a this, remember show? Falling in reverse, escape the fate, the word alive. So I decided to go with a nice metalcore shirt from, uh, well, one of my favorite bands, but it doesn't necessarily say my favorite, one of my favorite band's name on it. So I went all Ice Nine Kills on it, but I went with uh, the, their Cleaver, like the Spencer Charter's Cleaver clothing thing. So I went with something like this. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. So someone was trying to fight me because <laughs> he was drunk and thought it was like a whole entire like uh, religious like thing. And I was like, thing. I was like, no, this is an Ice Nine Kills thing, man. <laughs> and when I walked into the show, like the first two people that saw me, like this, this girl, she was like, oh, my God, where'd you get that shirt? That thing's amazing. I'm like, it's an Ice Nine Kills <laughs> thing. And I, I showed her oh, like yeah. showed her the business card they sent me when I ordered it because it was because nice. <laughs> I had literally the card that had the Cleaver clothing thing on it. And you flip it over. It's a fake OJ Simpson driver's license. Funny as shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, like after the word live set, all of a sudden this drunk guy started talking about religion. I'm like, dude, it's it's an Ice Nine Kills shirt. Like, what are you talking about? He was just screaming, yelling at me. His buddy comes over and is like, dude, just chill. It's an Ice Nine Kills thing. It's OK. And he really mm-hmm. wanted to fight me. The guy was drunk. I maybe had like because I was hanging out at my brother's bar beforehand. I had maybe two, three beers only over the course of three yeah. hours before I even got to the show. So I'm like, this guy wants to fight. He's going to go down. And the guy, the, his guy's buddy didn't want him to fight because he's he was, so, was yelling. He was like, if you fight this guy, you're going to lose. <laughs> All of a sudden, I see like five guys start walking over. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm screwed because it's probably these guys, drunk friends. I look at all five of these guys that walk over and they're all wearing Ice Nine Kills shirts. I'm like, this is going to be <laughs> awesome. So all of a sudden they're like, hey, man, what's going on? Yeah, is there a problem with this guy? I'm like, nah, he, nah he's just leaving. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this friend's like, yeah, man, we got to get him out of here. And he's like, I'm, his one friend was like, I'm sorry about that. He's like, however, because of how cool that shirt is, he's like, I'm mad I don't have one. I kind of want to take you out of the mosh pit. And I just was like, bring it. That dude did oh, knock yeah. me down like in the second song of Escape the Fates set. And he, but of course, knocks sure. me down. And he picks me right back up. I'm like, okay, we're of good. Course, like, yeah. you, got, you got a good community there. That's what I love about the rock and metal community. Oh, yeah. It's just, if, if someone's going to be dumb, so they're gonna stand up to because I've seen I saw somebody this was shoot this was five years ago now this was, I was here in Milwaukee I was seeing uh, Rise Against and Kill Switch Engaged open for them so right before nice. like right like right before Rise Against is set all of a sudden there is this big uh, skinhead neo Nazi guy has a big swastika tattoo on his back he's got a shirt yeah. off too I'm like this is not gonna go well for this guy so then all no, of a sudden he not. starts harassing this the couple these these two other fans like just getting in their face over stuff and people are like dude just shut up like just leave just because no one wants to deal yeah. with them all of a sudden he starts trying to pick a fight dude this one guy big guy like the guy that's going to end up killing everyone in the mosh comes out of nowhere just takes one swing pops a kid right under the jaw perfect oh, shot God. kid falls down knocked out here comes security guys laying on his stomach so his back and his tattoo are exposed they look down they look at us we just pointed him they look down and they grab him and drag this guy out of there. Yes. I'm just like, and then also during that show too, we were in the mosh pit and someone's someone lost their glasses and the lenses oh, came yeah. out. So all of a sudden, oh. like they notice it, and everyone, and so one guy was just like, "Stop!" So everyone stopped, backed up like three feet, and then That's like so the good. guy that lost their glasses and the guy that called out, they were scouring the ground while people were standing <laughs> still, while also still looking at the ground, like trying to see if they could find the lenses. I think they found them like ten seconds. Guy popped them back and he just went. Okay, and then everyone just bumped my stuff. <laughs> and back to it. <laughs> it was That's awesome because so awesome. all of a sudden Tim Mackerath was like, "What the hell happened over here?" And he and all of a sudden he's like, "Wait, wait, what?" Okay, that's fucking awesome. I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> we did so, it." I love that so much. But yeah, it's like with the rock and metal community, it's everyone's always looking out for each other. So exactly. it's like we're always got each other's backs, you know. Yeah, so it's like if all of a sudden you know. If someone's going to start getting in your face and try and fight you for some stupid reason, all the fans are going to come in and back the guy that 
is not trying to pick the fight. And the reason they're going to back that down trying to pick the fight is because the guy that's trying to pick the fight is going to end up walking away. And it's just like, we're exactly. just gonna, we're gonna, and we're going to just take care of it right then and there. And then, of course, you know, you get into the mosh pit. You got everyone's going nuts. Everyone's hitting each other and get knocked down. All of a sudden, you know, you got like three or four people trying to pick you up in that moment right then and there. And it's, yeah. it's, like, it's the, like you're never on the ground for more than three seconds before somebody else helps you and gets yeah. you right back into the groove. Because I've been knocked on the ground. I've been I mean, I've got I got a cut above my huge cut above my face during Motionless and White or actually during after the burial set was at Motionless and White's headlining show. And <laughs> after I got like taken care of, everyone's like, oh, you're back. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not missing this show. I mean, I had I had like a whole bunch of like toilet paper up here and so, uh, 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 this girl that met me at the show she ripped off a piece of her flannel so i could tie it around my head so i looked like a pirate and i was having so much fun like you jump and all of a sudden yeah you jump back in the pit i said fuck no why not man you're good to go i'm like i don't want to open up and bleed on you guys oh good call man good call i'm just like well no shit it's a good call why the hell would you want me bleeding on you because that happened during uh when i saw anti-flag and pennywise because during pennywise said some guy just had this huge cut in his face and he just kept going and after like once we kind of noticed after like a minute all of some people were starting to like turn on this guy just like get him the fuck out of here because he's bleeding over everybody you don't want that so we kind of like pushed him out of there and then all of a sudden security came and got him and i don't think they kicked him out but they like took him all the way to the back and like dude you can't fucking do that and especially because if he because after the security took him out if he came back Oh shit! Where's those yeah, shit's going with that? Especially with those older punk rock fans that were still moshing. Holy shit! They would have, they would have killed him. Yeah, and I mean, this is like you you did not mess around with that. Yeah, and he wasn't like a small guy either. I mean, he was like probably like maybe like five nine, five ten, but he was built like muscular, oh, yeah. not fat, just muscular. But I mean, these older punk it's rock fans. No oh, they, yeah. they'd be, it, it'd be, he he was no match for like three of those guys that Game coming over. at him. Yeah. No, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to think like some of the other crazy stuff too, like when it comes to shows, like some stories. But uh, I, I'll even bring up when I went to go see Guar because I I met I someone that follows the page like Guar. was at the show and I I saw her there and she's like, why did because I was wearing a black shirt. She's like, why why aren't you wearing a white shirt? I'm like, I, I'm I'm supposed to wear a white shirt. Why why am I supposed to wear a white shirt? Because they spray you with so much crap. <laughs> oh shit i mean i i came home that i came home after the show and my i mean if a cop would have pulled me over on my way home they would have asked me if i went through war just because of how much <laughs> like my face was so looked like it was just bloody as oh, all hell that's nasty oh my god the one thing i will say though was for that one because before before gore went on like i was in the circle pit having a good time with it and all of a sudden there was like a dad that was in there in the circle pit and he was like holding the hand of his like eleven year old son. It's like introducing oh, him to the pit. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I mean, everyone was loving it, and no one, no one, no one hit the kid though. It was like we we're trying to make that's sure good, no one, good. like no one hit the kid or hurt the kid, kind of thing. Right. But the kid had the most epic mullet I have ever seen in my <laughs> entire life. Like, it, like it went, it went, it almost went down. Like it went down, like you know, like the small of his back. I'm like, holy shit, that's a lot of fucking mullet right there. <laughs> that's so, the most American uh, thing I could see in like a kid. Yeah. So, Gore, so Gore comes on and like they're playing and everything, and all of a sudden this kid like he doesn't. <laughs> And the dad puts him up on his shoulders. The kid doesn't have a shirt on, and he's just rocking out. Oh. Every member from Guar see this, and they're spraying everyone in the crowd. All of a sudden, they completely stop spraying everybody. Because, and this is against like what they're going to be supposed to be doing in the set. But I mean, they couldn't resist, right. and it was perfect. So they all stop the guitarist, bassist, at least everybody, even like the extras on there, and they all walk to the center. <laughs> <laughs> turned like like aimed at this kid and, and this shot him at the, the, the place <laughs> went freaking insane just because it's like this little this little like 11 year old kid just rocking out having a great time is never gonna, gonna forget the moment where his dad put him on his shoulders at a uh, at guar and guar recognized it with the epic with the epic mullet and sprayed the <laughs> ever-loving shit out of him and i swear this it did it wasn't like a quick thing i mean they did this for like a full minute that's insane my god i feel bad for that kid's mom it's just like what happened to him i'll put it this way you can you can tell by the time that 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 kid and his dad got home that the mom and the dad had this epic fight over what had happened you could tell but it it, it was so worth it (laughs) but it was but and the and the epic fight you know in the end you know who's actually gonna win Who's that? The dad, for the reason being because the kid would have had so much fun and 
in the end, it's like that is an ultimate like bonding thing. So you couldn't beat yeah, it. It's it's too hard. That's a life experience you're never gonna forget. <laughs> oh God, no! I mean, if if I had a, something like that, I'd be like, that'd have been great. But you know what? I didn't start really going to concerts till I was like. 15 16 so i didn't get that, uh, that kind of and i want to see if i can get my little cousin to go and do that but he's not so little no more so i can't go do that with him uh, like true. put him up my shoulders be like spray him because he's like 150 pounds and i don't want to <laughs> oh, hold shit. him up my shoulders for a whole song i could but i don't want to yeah that wouldn't go over well i mean it'd be like just like hitting up the squat rack but all of a sudden like my neck would be like dude this fucking sucks <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can get down there it's like get the fuck down white why they notice you, man? They notice you. you. They saw your fucking sign. You're the only. You're, you're the only big fucking person on someone's shoulders. They're gonna notice your fucking sign. Except the, the except. Oh, there's women over there on people's shoulders trying to get the band's attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going down. Why? You're not beating them. <laughs> <laughs> oh no way. Oh god, you're never gonna beat them. On that. No. <laughs> I got one question for you about an album that came out earlier this year, though. Yeah, what is it? How's the new Five Finger Death Punch album holding up for you? How it's holding? Oh, so when I, I mean, when I reviewed it, I gave it a six out of ten. I actually mm-hmm. haven't revisited it since the end of February because that's when it came I out. Either. Um, for me, for Five Finger Death Punch, I just don't really get like I was talking about it earlier with like you know with different styles of metal because they're more like that groove metal style. It's just something yeah, I really don't yeah. associate very much with. It's something I don't hate, but it's just not my favorite kind of style. But in Fair terms enough. of when I rethink about it, in terms of Five Finger Death Punch album. It's like it's a I think it's a good album. I don't think it's a great album. I think it's a good album, especially better than their last two albums, because when you listen to the lyrics on it, I mean, Ivan Moody went more personal than he really has in a lot of past albums. And yeah, the vocals that were the emotion, the vocals that really brought from that is really what shine on the album. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I feel like the album as a whole overall, it's. It hasn't stood up very well, but I feel like Five Figure Death Punch for me personally is one of those bands. They have like good standout songs from each one of their albums, but like albums as a whole can kind of be a bit tedious to listen to because they kind of get repetitive and whatnot as you go through. But I did like the singles from the new one, and I thought some of the other deeper cuts were also really good. So I mean, they're, they're, Overall, I their, their first single, Inside Out, was probably the best song on the track. And I mean, mm-hmm. if putting the best song on the track, in my opinion, is the lead single. I mean, that's always a oh, that's always a, that's always a good move to go with because then it's yeah, you get people into it, you're gonna get it sold. But then all of a sudden, mm-hmm. it's like you know, I was I'm always hoping like oh maybe you know one of the other single one of the other deeper cuts is gonna be my favorite song just so that I can be right. surprised. I mean, like yeah. Polaris. I mean, I like their single, but Absolutely. then when I heard above my head, it was just like, I'm done. Like, that is yeah. it. Like, I'm so glad they kept good. that in there. But yeah. I like, I know, uh, I say, I know what you're talking about with Five Finger as well, where it's just as time goes on, it doesn't necessarily hold up as well. And mm-hmm. one album for me that I really liked from last year, and I still like the album, but it's just not holding up as well as I thought it was, was uh, Skillet's new album. I thought it was really yeah. good when it came out. And I'm just like, it's kind of r- repetitive. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I find with there were a couple of albums like that from last year where it's like there's it's too much where it's like repetitive and it's, it doesn't just stand out as much as you would like it to. And there are also a lot of albums where like the lead single also comes out to be like the best song. And you kind of you can kind of expect that a lot of the time. But you kind of, like you said, you're kind of always hoping there will be something more from it. But you can re- appreciate the good lead single and all that, but the yeah. rest of the album kind of. That's why looking. And... That's why looking back at it in, in retrospect, like if I had been really into this and really understand what was going on, like if I would have been back in like the back in 2018, because I think that I think the two best albums of the whole entire decade. And the worst album the whole entire decade all came out in 2018. And taking a look at like the singles that came off of those albums, uh, uh, by th- I, in the end, I think the best album from that whole entire decade is is got to be the Silver Scream from Ice Nine Kills. Oh, like, oh god! Amazing, so it's like man. you take a look at the lead singles would have been like Stabbing in the Dark, uh, right. American Nightmare, and a Grave Mistake, and it's like these are absolutely fantastic songs, especially a Grave Mistake. Sure. But then all of a sudden, the rest of the album comes out, and it's just. It comes out just as well, and then all of a sudden you end it with it. It is the end. It's just boom, done. I love that song the so o- much. I'll say the other album that came out in that year. I think it came out like the week before the Silver Scream came out. That is also like I. It's also really up there for me. Is Disease by Beartooth. Like holy oh, you really sh- like that one? Oh nice. god, yeah. Because I hadn't heard the Silver Scream before that, so that was my pick for album of the year. But now I'm like, 
I made a whole entire <laughs> retrospective video. Like that would have been such a hard choice for me. I probably would end. Yeah. I think. I think yeah. in the video I said I was going to stick with Beartooth because that was my original choice. Which I, if on a video I would, but like I can't get enough of the Silver Scream. But yeah. then I was think. But like the singles on that one just kept up the energy, kept up the intensity for disease, <laughs> and it's just like it just didn't relent when the song when the rest of the album came out. Like they just kept hitting those hard uh, ones. But then mm-hmm. consequently, when we got to the what I thought was the worst album of the whole entire decade from one of my favorite bands which really killed me but oh. it was like i listened to like the first thing i'm like okay there's like not much guitar work going on here but it's a fun song to listen to and then all of a sudden the other singles start coming out, i'm just like uh <laughs> which band was this <laughs> 30 seconds to mars oh god i i didn't listen to them, but I heard it was really, really bad. Do not listen. I, 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 I love listening to the band. I love listening to a uh, beautiful lie album. This is war. Their self-titled album is fantastic. I love listening to all those three, but I will. I cannot listen to America. I can't do it. Yeah, it's yeah, so diff. It's it's yeah. it's so it's it's way 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 too poppy for my taste. Yeah, that's understandable. My favorite album of 2018 was actually Ghost Spring Hell. That was a lot of people's too. That one, I just loved it so much. Like the singles on that one were already good. Like it was starting off to be pretty strong. Yeah. But the entire album, like you've got stuff for the hard rock fans. You've got stuff for the ghost metal fans. Like the song Faith was one of the heaviest songs on that album. And the song that sent me for that one was their instrumental Miasma. Oh, yeah. That, like that when they brought the saxophone in after they ripped off beat it like i was just like how do you incorporate all of that into such a great song it was so if cool if you're able to encapsulate so much of that stuff into one song it's like you know you have something brewing and it's just gonna Absolutely. work out perfectly but it's just it so- but it's just like i know with a lot of like end of the year end of the ni- 2019 list when you look at like best of the decade a lot of times like top songs and top albums came from ghosts all right yeah, yeah, a lot of them did. Um, Loudwire ranked Square Hammer as the best metal song of the year. Yeah. Or the decade, sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to think what they That's ranked. something, like, you can probably agree with it, but, like, it's kind of like one of the predictable choices, I guess, but it still was a fantastic song. Yeah. I'm, yeah, un- I totally understandable where I was, like, looking at Loudwire as something, like, for best stuff of the decade. I'm like, okay, there's a lot of stuff I would disagree with, but a couple of things I would agree with. And I was mm-hmm. looking, I was a little pissed. I was, like, they went, I was going through the rock songs. I'm like, okay, I'll take a look. The first one that's on the list from the bottom list, I'm like, help is on the way from Rise Against. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, oh, I would have picked a much different one to put ri- for Rise Against to put on here than Help Is On The Way. Don't don't get me wrong. I do like Help Is On The Way, but I think right. the lead single off of that album from Endgame Architects is much better because I love the intro Fair to enough. it. I love the violence. I, a lot of the stuff on Wolves was fantastic, and it's just I really went underappreciated. The violence went underappreciated. <laughs> far From Perfect. Miracle is their most underrated song by far. Yeah. And I'm just like, but then, again, some of those but then this, again, again, it's all coming from me. I'm just like, Damn, I just want to see yeah, Rise Against on this shit. Hard rise Against <laughs> yeah. And I gotta he call myself out. Sense. I gotta call myself out on that too. I'm just like, I just like I I I connect with the band so well, even even though I'm like, I've liked them since I was like, you know, 14. Like they became my favorite band when I was 14. It's 11 years later and they have not relinquished that title. I'm like, they're sticking yeah. with it. Yeah, you can't you can't let go after being such a fan for so long, you know? Oh, I will never let go. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, Un- unlike unlike the movie Titanic when Rose like I'll never let go Jack and just let him float away it's like I'm like I know, I'm never gonna let go and it's just like well let go no I don't want to no. never <laughs> I, I did uh, not expect to bring out a freaking Titanic reference during a podcast so like I said at the right before we even started chewing this I'm probably gonna do something that's just really wacky or just like mess up completely somewhere online I always do it. I came so close to not doing something like that. <laughs> Dude, so and well. then I make a freaking Titanic reference. <laughs> oh, well. <clears throat> it's all got to come full circle, man. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was awesome. I say, I'm taking a look at the time, dude. We have right around two hours. Holy shit. Wow. That's awesome. Dude, that's that's insane. It seems like every time <laughs> we like, covered a lot of stuff today. We did. And that's one thing I have like why well, I always bring up like doing these podcasts, like it's gonna be more like a conversation because if it's, if I have a hard time limit with with a uh, with a guest, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna respect that hard time limit. I'm gonna make sure I hit that. However, if it's gonna be open, like more of a conversation thing, because then it's just not 
super duper rigid. It's something that's going to flow more. You're going to get so much more substance out of it. And plus, then you're going to get some crazy stories in there and end it with a Titanic reference. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, (laughs) yeah. It's like, well, where, where the hell did that come from? Well, it, it, it happened. I mean, and that, and pretty soon I'm like, well, I get, well, if I, I mean, I did it on the audio, but now I got to do something crazy in the video. So I'm going to be like Ricky Bob. I'm just like, I, I don't know what to do with my hands. Just <laughs> yeah, the car, the, well, the, yeah. the car went real well. The, 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 album, the album was real good. You know, it was very consistent. And uh, man, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, I got the okay from James on that one. I know I'm doing well. Well, perfect. either really well or really cringy. One of the two. I don't know which one anymore. <laughs> You're talking about your favorite bands. What do you want? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just geeking out right now because, well, that's always what happens on these podcasts. It's like once once I get talking about music, like I'm going to start geeking out on stuff just because, well, no, why, why not? That's what, that's what I like to do. So I'm going to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, James, this was absolutely fantastic. We covered a lot. We really dove deep into Declaration by Red. We touched on August Burns Red yep. and then. We just went and had like that whole entire like 45 minute session of just enjoying music and just going nuts, shared some incredible stories as well. So James, while I have you on here, before I send you on your merry way, I want to say thank you for following my Sunday Rock Tales today. Thank you for being on the Core Progression podcast. Means a lot to me because I'm trying to put out as much as I as I can to, you know, grow rock, grow metal. And then just connect with as many people as possible. And this is just a testament to it. So thank you very much for following all our stuff and supporting us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, man. I love your community on Instagram. And this podcast is a great thing to be a part of. And you know what we're going to do from here on out? We're just going to keep it growing. Like, woo! Hell yeah. And if there's another album in the f- if there's another album in the future that you're like, fuck yeah, I want to talk about this one on the podcast again. Man, you know how to get in contact with me. Oh, hell yeah. Appreciate that, man. (laughs) Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. Always a pleasure. Thank you for supporting us. And have a good day, man. Rock on. You too. Just take care. See you. See you. Well, 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 everybody, thank you for listening to my interview with James, one of the My Song of the Day Rock 2000 Today fans. He's been consistently commenting on our stuff and being a part of our community. And you see what happens when you're consistently a part of our community and you want to talk about something on the Core Progression podcast and album. You want to know what happens? We make it happen. So if you guys are listening to this and you want to be on the Core Progression podcast, you guys know where to reach me via Instagram DM, Twitter DM, Facebook message. Um, comments um smoke signals uh snail mail uh, i'm regular u.s mail uh, i'm trying to think of some other crazy ways uh the pony express carrier pigeons however you want to get a hold of me that's how you can do it because well as long as you get a hold of me and we can find out because i'll try and answer every single one so hell yeah if you want to be on the podcast um we this is number two of three for the week next week or actually next podcast i should say we've got a very very special guest as well but this is one that's going to be a great tie into a bunch of stuff. So get ready for that. And then following week, I'm hoping for episode number 69 because, well, that's just funny to have an episode 69. I want to make that a big episode. So we're going to see how what kind of uh, guests we can have on that one. We'll see what happens. If you got any suggestions, please put it in my DM inbox, whatever the hell you want to uh, snail mail, uh, carrier pigeon, Pony Express mm-hmm. via uh exploration ship in the 1490s whatever you, you want to send me suggestions for anything please send them that way but that's gonna be it for me today thank you for listening and watching the cold progression podcast brought to you by my song they rock 2000 to today my name is kevin look for next episode coming out in two days and you guys know how i end every single one of these episodes with a big healthy and hearty 